Okay, let's begin this plenary. Oh, first I'm supposed to tell you that thank you so much for making the effort to get back here. There will be a table set up in the back of the hall where you can take your, your, your dishes and napkins and all that sort of thing. And just for your information, uh, one of the women processing today, vested and processed, was Maria de Jesus, who is 104 years old. So, you know what, um, golly, I think we'll dispense with the singing. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, fine. I mean, he's prepared, but we'll, we'll dispense with the singing. And I think we're going to go then and tell you another thing also, that to be fair to the three nominees, we are reordering this afternoon's agenda to give the nominees time to prepare their speeches. There will be an order of the day at 2 o'clock p.m. for the nominee speeches, and we will go immediately to the fourth ballot so that we can do the orders of the day at 2.30 for the consideration of the Constitution's bylaws and continuing resolutions. Uh, point of order, microphone one. 11. 11? Just, I'm 11, sorry. <laughs> Just Felici, West Virginia, Western Maryland Synod. I, I approach humbly. Um, that I misspoke with the number referring to the constitutional amendment that I want to address at 2.30. Um, I spoke in the speech about the correct number, but I did not in my formal motion. Um, I said 5.01, but what I was discussing was 7.52. Okay, 7.02. Five two. Five two. Thank you, Reverend Chair. You're very welcome. All right. On the screen is the proposed schedule for this afternoon. Can we have consensus to approve this amended order of business? Is anyone opposed? Hearing no objection, the amended order of business is adopted. The Reverend Ibrahim Azar, Bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land, was planning to be with us, but he was unable to secure a visa to attend our churchwide assembly. We were delighted to learn that he recorded a greeting. Let's share those greetings with you now. Dear Sister Bishop Elizabeth Eaton, staff and assembly members of the ELCA, Greetings from Jerusalem and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land. I bring you blessings as you gather listening for the Spirit of God to lead you in your work these next few days. Thank you for the invitation to commune with you, but due to visa issues I am unable to be there physically and share in your visioning. Briefly, I would like to inform you of the state of the ELCJHL and the situation we are facing as Palestinians. As a church, we continue to trust in the hopeful message of the Gospel and believe in the redeeming resurrection of Christ. Brothers and sisters, we are strong in our faith. However, there are increasing issues that make the lives of our members challenging and threaten to shake our faith. Recently, our older students struggled to obtain Israeli permit in order to go out from the Palestinian territories to attend a Bible school but we are happy to say that we had four summer camps, groups, and more than 120 students attended despite the problems. Another development which is not easy is the work of gender justice. We are on the leading edge of the churches and other religions in the region in promoting fair and just equality for all women. We have rewritten our ecclesiastical court policies to ensure that women 
have just outcomes in cases of family issues like inheritance and divorce. Also, some sacred Christian sites are under threat of being taken, which is a concern for us all, Christians and Muslims. We stand with our ecumenical friends in their fight. I wish I had more time to tell you about the other work of the people, but I will conclude by asking for your prayers. Pray that we stand strong and steadfast during our trials so that we may continue to follow Jesus' command to love. And we will pray for your assembly because we are cherished together despite our distances. We are gathered as one church by the Holy Spirit for God's word. I would like also to thank you for all support for our work, for our people, for our church. Thank you that you don't leave us in this situation alone. In Christ your Bishop Ibrahim Azam. Thank you. This past weekend, the African Descent Lutheran Association Biennial Assembly met, and President Adama Fay of the Lutheran Church in Senegal was present with their assembly. We are pleased that he was able to extend his travels to be with us. President Fay, it is our delight to receive you as our guest. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. Bonsoir, tout le monde. Sister and brother of the Lutheran Church of America, I bring you greetings from your siblings in Christ from the Lutheran Church of Senegal in Western Africa. First, I would like to congratulate Bishop Eton for re your re election and congratulate also the Senate for the Assembly. It has been a honor for me to be here with you during this Elka White Church Assembly and have been also invited to participate to the African Descent Lutheran Association Assembly this past week also. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Rafael Malpica of the Global Mission. And thank you also, Dr. Reverend Andrea Walker and Reverend Lamott, President of the ALDA, for this inviting me to this assembly. Thank you also, Reverend Dr. Deborah, for the Grand Canyon Synod, our companion synod. Yes, we are church. We are a growing church, but we don't need that our church to be shaped by the world. We need to be a church in the world and a church who lights the, church, the, the world. In Africa, we used to say, when a tree is growing, it's a beautiful tree. But when it gets old, it may be full of parasites. I pray that our church will be a church full of Holy Spirit, a church that alights the world. Truly, we are a church, a church in Jesus Christ, and that we can read Romans 12, verse 5. We, we are called to be a church wherever we are. 
The Lutheran Church in Senegal is a young church, a very small church, but we have some things to donate, to give. Thank you very much, Bishop. Here we go. Wait a minute, we have, are you going to speak some more? Yes, good. With your support, the Lutheran Church in Senegal continue the, God, the work of God. Through your support, we have translated our Bible in our Senate language. And we are now in a second translation also in the Purani language also. Together, we are training lay people so they can be more active and effective in the, in the land and the work of God. Together also, we are supporting children and women and persons living in HIV AIDS. Together also, we are changing life of many people by helping them to increase milk production for their own cows. Through those actions, we are witnessing the love of Jesus Christ through our works. But the Lutheran Church in Senegal also faced challenges, challenges that are different from what you have here in the United States. Senegal is a 95% of population Muslims. While we are living in peace, we were keeping peace between us. And that is the challenge that we need to focus on. The second challenge we are facing now is, as you know, Senegal is bordered by countries where there is radicalization, radicalization and extremist violence. Please continue praying for us, and the church in Senegal also is praying for you. May the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you safe, and we wish the best for this wide assembly. Thank you very much. Thank you. And here is a gift that you might remember us by. Thank you. Merci, we, beaucoup. merci beaucoup. De rien. <laughs> Let's move to the assembly consideration for the strategy toward authentic diversity within the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Several resource people have joined me are joining me on the stage for our discussion. They are the task force members who are present with the support of the ELCA ethnic associations. Abraham Allende and Albert Starr, co-conveners of the strategy toward authentic diversity task force. Priscilla Austin, Joseph Castaneda Carrera, Kelly Sherman Conroy, Kader Khalila, Maribel Lorenzaza, Dana Matisse, Sarika Nalavala, Tohina Reish, Lamont Wells, who's working on his speech. We have Joanne Conray, Kader El Yatim, Martin Lopez Vega, Daniel Peter Penyamaka, Judith Roberts, Program Director for Racial Justice Ministries. On Tuesday evening, you had an opportunity to raise questions and discuss the matter at a hearing. 
Voting members, you will need to refer to the strategy toward authentic diversity within the ELCA in Section 5 of your pre-assembly report for the recommendation of the Church Council upon which we will be voting. I now invite Bishop Abraham Allende, the co-convener of the Task Force for the Strategy Toward Authentic Diversity within the ELCA, and the Reverend Priscilla Austin to share an introduction to the action you will be voting on. I guess I should stand up. No, I'll stay down here. <laughs> um, since its inception, this church has wrestled with the challenge of becoming an authentically multi-ethnic, multicultural church. The vision and promised kingdom and reign of God lie within us. This transformative power for being God's change agent in society is intricately bound to our own transformation as God's people. I call the Reverend Priscilla Austin of the Northwest Washington Synod, who co-authored the resolution for a strategy toward authentic diversity that was adopted by the 2016 Churchwide Assembly. The 2016 Assembly adopted a resolution to create a task force composed entirely of persons of color from regions and synods across the country so that this, the views and voices of this church, so often unheard and unheeded, might benefit the whole church. We have this ministry together. Here with me on this platform are some of the members of the Strategic Task Force for Authentic Diversity and representatives of the ELCA Ethnic Associations. Not everyone is able to be here in attendance today. The task force has put forth five key strategic areas of focus with accompanying rec recommendations. Those five areas are theological framing and equipping, healing action, structural accountability, theological education and leadership, and partnership with full communion and ecumenical partners. These five strategic areas represent the basis for a change of heart and mind, how we collectively think about ethnic diversity and inclusivity in the ELCA. Thank you. No amendments were submitted. I call on Bishop Allende to read the recommendation from the Church Council. To thank the Task Force for Strategic Authentic Diversity and all who contributed to its work to develop a report and recommendations on how this church exhibits authentic diversity and formulates its own goals and expectations for racial diversity and inclusion. To call this church in all its expressions into a time of confession reflection, and healing as its members renew an honest relational engagement in the body of Christ. To urge the Church and all its expressions in related agencies, organizations, and institutions to intentionally engage more deeply in the recommendations named in the report and to provide funds in support of these recommendations, and to call upon the office of the presiding bishop in collaboration with appropriate units in the churchwide organization to establish and oversee processes for consideration, assignment, implementation of, and accountability for these recommendations identified to the churchwide organization and to report regularly to the church council. The action does not require a second. Is there any speaking to the recommendation? Microphone one. Uh, Pastor Don Roginski, Sierra Pacific Synod, they, them, their pronouns. 
I um, speak in favor of this resolution and I bring a letter of support from the proclaimed community. Anybody else from the community please stand? Our letter reads, we, a community of LGBTQ, I'm sorry, LGBTQIA plus candidates and rostered ministers in the ELCA confess and lament the structures of white supremacy that permeate all institutions, including and especially the church. We profess that any discussion of liberation must be grounded in dialogue on race and white supremacy. We strive towards collective solidarity with our siblings of color, recognizing the racism historically and presently embodied in queer communities. We reject the mentality of scarcity that positions marginalized communities against each other, particularly people of color and the queer community which also invisibilizes queer and trans people of color. We reject any attempt to use the queer community to distract or diffuse explicit calls for racial justice. We trust people of color who have thoughtfully and faithfully constructed this document, conspiring with the Holy Spirit, even consulting with white allies. We trust the, the writers of color's visioning their experience, and their hearts. We know that our liberation is bound up in that of each other. Therefore, we, a community of LGBTQIA plus candidates... Thank, thank you. Could you... Do you want that into the record? Can you bring it to the desk? Thank you so much. Microphone 11. Pastor Jessica Cain, Southwestern Texas Synod, speaking on behalf of myself and 53 other young leaders in this church. The writer of 1 John says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar and God's word is not in us. We fully support the strategy for authentic diversity in the ELCA. For too long, this church has been a denomination that does not reflect the full expression and gift of the body of Christ. We began this denomination with a commitment to becoming more diverse and have failed time and time again. We confess our sin and lament our complicity in systems of racism and white supremacy. We confess that we have consistently and systematically denied our siblings of color opportunity for leadership and full participation in the church and society. We confess that we are a church that has raised up white supremacist murderers. We confess our sin and lament that here in this assembly there has been language policing, whitewashing of history, and the assumption that white and light are good while black and dark are bad. We lament that we have waited until the last full day of business to even address this strategy. For all these sins that we have said and the ones we have left unsaid, we confess. We would like to express our thankfulness for this task force. Once again, we have asked for the people of color among us to take responsibility for our failure to authentically be Christ's beautifully diverse church. We will hold ourselves and this church in all its expressions responsible to be truly welcoming, to have conversations in our communities about white privilege and our complicity in systems of racism, to actively denounce and work against white supremacy and implement the resolutions of this task force. Today, we pledge to support and honor the work of the task force in our context, and we urge this assembly to approve the recommendations of this work. Thank you. Are you speaking to Bishop Wee, are you speaking to the okay. uh, yes, sorry, I didn't know I was right. Up. Microphone eleven. Shall we Brian Wee, Northwest Washington Synod? She her, I speak in support. As someone who is deeply concerned about racism and white supremacy and white privilege. I would like to confess something before all of you today. And this is hard, but a few days ago I was at the Hilton and I mistakenly thought that a person of color who is part of our delegation was a server. And I asked this person for something. 
When it happened, I was extremely embarrassed, wished it had not happened, and wanted the whole incident to just disappear. It was so embarrassing. But I tell you this story not because I'm proud of it, obviously. I'm completely not proud of this. And I apologize to Olivia for this. I need to do better. White siblings, we need to do better. That is why we need this statement before us, the strategy toward authentic diversity within the ELCA. Thank you. Microphone three. Uh, Mara Darston, she, hers, young adult rep from Metro New York Synod. Uh, I wanted to thank the people sitting before us today for your work towards this document, your love towards this document, and your love towards this church that for a long time has failed our siblings of color. Um, as I look at the names of the people who worked on this document, I am proud to be from New York and proud to know so many of you that are from New York. And I would ask that this church both pass this motion, both this state, this strategy, um, and also take into consideration what this means for our young people and how will we, we will teach this to our young people and hope that the ELCA will take this to the next step in looking at the dates it chooses for our national youth gathering to ensure that the young people of the Metro New York Synod are able to attend both the National Youth Gathering, but also the mile event, which takes place while they are still in school. Thank you. Thank you. That's four speakers in favor of the, of the, uh, the motion, so debate is closed. Before we vote on the recommendation, I'm asking Bishop Gidalia Negron Camano of the Caribbean Synod to lead us in prayer. Dear God, we come to you in this moment asking for your wisdom when we vote so that we can be a diverse, really diverse church. Bless us with your wisdom and over all with your love for each one, for our neighbors, or who for all the people who are different from us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. To vote for the action, vote one. Oh, get your voting machines. Um, to vote against, opposed, vote two. Please vote now. Voting is closed. Let's see the results. The strategy is adopted. Let's stand and sing hymn 21, hallelujah.
Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. Since the beginning of this church, there have been several social policy resolutions. Social policy resolutions serve as this church's policy directives until social, a social resolution is replaced by subsequent, subsequent resolutions, rendered moot by subsequent social teaching documents or sent to the archive by a churchwide assembly. In accordance with the policies and procedures of the ELCA for addressing social concerns, a review is conducted after 25 years. There have been 21 social policy resolutions proposed for archival. None were removed from on block. I call on Secretary Berger to read the action. I move the action on page one on archival of certain social policy resolutions. To archive the social policy resolutions identified in the 2019 archival of certain pol social policy resolutions document as suitable for archive in accordance with the policies and procedures of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America for addressing social concerns. We will now proceed to vote. Insert your voting cards. For yes, press one. For two, press no. Please vote now. Wait, wait a minute. No, don't vote now. For yes, press one. For no, vote. Press two. I'm so sorry. Okay, now we'll try to vote. Voting is closed. Let's see the results. Thank you. It's been adopted. We actually, golly, we have some more time. We'll do, we'll do a quick video here. This is my professor from Union Theological Seminary, Hyang Kyang Chang. Uh, she was the one who believed in me, even though it took much longer than I expected. And had it not been for that uh, time and that decision, uh, I would have lost hope. So I would think of her as the woman uh, who has helped me to get me where I am today. Um, but I cannot forget uh, the countless invisible women on whose shoulders um, my journey rests, my success rests. So I do acknowledge them. And above all, my father, who has been that foundational source of inspiration in bringing that pastor in me, in bringing that bold woman in me. So uh, he, he, he may not qualify as a woman, but definitely as the person who has inspired me to be uh, the person that, that I am today.
one more video. The cool thing of it is, is that my mom was at my ordination. In fact, I was supposed to be ordained at the Synod-wide Assembly, um, but that was later on in the year, and I didn't think she was going to make it. She had cancer. And so I talked to the bishop, and I already had my call. And so he said, okay, we'll ordain you by yourself. And so they had a private, well, not private, it was a worship service, but it was just for one ordinand. And my mom came with her little scooter, and she sat in the front row, and she was very, very proud. So I think when I first started seminary, she kind of went, uh-oh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> she probably said, what's wrong with you? But I know when I was ordained that she was very proud. We now have the opportunity to hear from the three persons who received the highest number of votes on the third ballot for secretary. They are here arriving. I ask them to come onto the stage. As they come forward, it might be helpful to review how this time will be structured. The three nominees have drawn names to determine the order in which they will speak. Sue Rothmeyer, Steve Herr, Lamont Wells. Each will have five minutes to address the assembly. At four minutes and 30 seconds, a yellow light on the podium will be a 30 second warning for each speaker. At five minutes, a red light will indicate that the time is up. Please hold your applause for the end of all the speaker's presentations. Let us, then after that, we'll proceed immediately to hearing, no, hold well, now, I'm sorry. Let us now proceed immediately to hearing from our first nominee. Words and the word. My life has been shaped by both. My decision to major in English at Luther College was influenced not only by the words I heard from professors in the classroom, but in their witness to the word as part of their daily presence in chapel. My gap year experience at Holden Village introduced meaningful words about God's justice and inclusivity as we centered ourselves in the word nightly at Vespers. Most of my graduate thesis on the rhetoric of abolitionists Angelina and Sarah Grimke was written in a secluded upper room in the University of Wisconsin-Madison Campus Ministry Center. It was my campus pastor, Phil Knudsen, who posed the what next question and asked me if I'd thought about campus ministry as a vocation. I thought about it for 10 plus years as a lay campus minister at Iowa State University. I continue to think about campus ministry, colleges and universities, schools and early childhood education, youth ministry and the youth gathering, young adult ministry and outdoor ministry for the next 17 years as I lived out my vocation in various ways within the church-wide organization. Whether drafting board meeting minutes, creating policies for campus ministry, or preaching for chapel, Word and the Word continued to meet and mingle. Seven years ago, I moved into the office of the secretary where attention to words and comma placement made me appreciate those English professors even more as I work with colleagues to create and edit minutes, prepare the over 1,400 pages of the pre-assembly report, and respond to questions concerning governing documents and policy manuals. When I lead workshops on the model constitution for congregations, I like to point out that the required sections are part of every congregation's governing documents because they speak to the ways in which we are church, we are Lutheran, we are church together, we are church for the sake of the world. That is true of the constitution for synods and the constitutions of our whole church. And while those documents contain a lot of words, those words are informed by the word. For as we read in chapter two of our church's constitution, the proclamation of God's message to us as both law and gospel is the word of God beginning with the word in creation and centering in all its fullness in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Words and the word. 
the governing documents of this church are shaped by both. Heidi Schreck, in her Broadway play, What the Constitution Means to Me, begins her analysis by saying that the U.S. Constitution is a living document. The same could and should be said about the constitutions of this church. Every three years, this assembly has the opportunity to breathe new life into those documents as you take action on amendments that have been forwarded for your consideration. The Lutheran Church in America, meeting in 1970, changed one word in its constitution, striking man and inserting person, which made it possible for women to be ordained. One little word, as Martin Luther would say, changed the course of history. Secretary Berger often speaks of the office of the secretary as a service unit to the church. This is an apt description of the ways in which this office supports congregations, synods, and the church-wide organization. It has been my privilege to work with gifted and committed colleagues that serve this church by offering legal and risk management services, planning meetings, managing the rosters of this church, archiving this church's history, and caring for the words of this church in many and various documents. This minister of word and service would be humbled and honored to serve as secretary with these colleagues and with you, as together we care for the living words of this church and boldly proclaim the living word of God. Thank you, Stephen Hur. Presiding Bishop Eden, Secretary Berger, Vice President Horn, voting members, guests, and churchwide staff, grace, mercy, and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I give thanks to God for this church, which I love deeply, and I am deeply humbled and grateful for the opportunity to stand before you this day. The Office of Secretary is first and foremost one of service to this church in all of its expressions. My work on the Legal and Constitutional Review Committee of the Church Council and co-chairing two churchwide Assembly Memorials Committees and working with all three of the ELCA secretaries has shaped my understanding of this office as one of service and assistance to this church. It exists to serve the ministries unfolding throughout this church and the world in new and engaging ways. This week, we have made known what we value as a church, and it has been inspiring. We value that we are church. We value spreading God's love and grace to all the world. We value working towards greater authentic ethnic and racial diversity. We value the role of all God's people in the life of this church and in the world, regardless of their ethnicity, race, gender, sexual orientation, or age. We value justice, justice for women, the oppressed, and the marginalized. We value ecumenical and interreligious relationships that seek mutual understanding and cooperation with all our neighbors of all faiths. And we value and celebrate the wonderful gifts of women who serve as pastors, bishops, deacons, and deaconesses. With all of these and so much more, that we value and hold dear, the role of the Secretary's Office is to help this church move forward with these values and priorities in good order, with clarity, transparency, and faithfulness. I believe the Secretary's role is one of service to help members of this church come together as we have done this week, to articulate our common will, Part of this moving forward will require working together to examine governing documents to see where they may need to be challenged or changed. How might these documents better reflect these values that we have set forth this week? How might our governing documents facilitate new models and structures of ministry emerging all across our country? This is an exciting time to be part of the ELCA. 
we draw on a deep Lutheran theological tradition rooted in a reforming movement, working together with unity, with a spirit of collaboration among congregations, synods, and the churchwide expression. How might we look to both reform and renew our governance structures to meet both the challenges and the opportunities facing this church as we move into a third decade in the 21st century. We will need good governance that is accountable and adaptive to support the new ministries and emphases emerging throughout this church. Good governance through our constitutions, roster manuals, meeting planning and archiving can position us to face the challenges ahead and address the larger structural and governance questions that are before us. None of this governance work takes place without being intentional to cultivate, nurture, and maintain good relationships across the church. As Lutherans, we are about reform and renewal. And as we look to reform and renew our governance, we can do so only knowing that God is with us and that we must be an interconnected church. As secretary, I would be deeply committed to fostering those connections, instilling a spirit of service in this church, supporting the vision of our presiding bishop, and working together with all of you. Drawing on our rich history, we find inspiration from God's word and from our ancestors in faith. And at the same time, we embrace the gifts of the saints of today, whose gifts and talents are come together to reevaluate and to enhance our governance for the sake of proclaiming the love of God to all and the good news of Jesus Christ, the crucified and resurrected one, whose grace and faithfulness is the source of our faith and our hope for the future. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Lamont Wells. Grace and peace be unto you and peace from God, our holy parent. If you're happy in Jesus, can you clap your hands and let me hear you? Amen. Let me tell you a little bit more about me. In Northwest Philadelphia, I was born and raised. On the playground is where I spent most of my days, chilling out, maxing, relaxing, all cool, all playing golf outside in the school. So then a couple of guys who were up to no good started making trouble in my neighborhood. Brothers and sisters, I have never, ever been in a fight in my life. But as the song goes, my mom got scared. And I'm only standing here today before you in this assembly because of the grace of God and because a black mother named Beverly Ann Wells saved my life. Nothing else makes me a better secretary and leader for this church than the unconditional love and training she gives me, and I still honor her today. The interreligious work this church has been doing and that I was a part of bringing before this assembly, assembly as a part of the team, thank God that we passed it. I was a little embarrassed there for just a quick second, but we got it together and we became the church. That very work that we saw yesterday is my very family foundation. My grandmother, Elnora, who raised me in the Christian church. My grandfather, Lindbergh, was an atheist until he was on his deathbed and he wanted some assurance. My dad, Ali, was a Muslim studying to be an imam. And my mother was an African spiritualist until I became a Lutheran in the late 90s and now she hangs out with us. I have a great friend and family support system, even now, an even greater cloud of witnesses that watch over me. The secretary is an officer of the ELCA, and I'd be an officer and a gentle person who is willing and able to serve under our presiding bishop, Elizabeth Eaton, with other officers and leaders in this church. I have reviewed the description many times in our governing documents, and I still said yes. I have studied the nuances of our Constitution and have vision for some appropriate changes that will help meet our needs in this present age. And most importantly, I have prayed about this position for quite a while as I have felt the call to this role in our church by faith. 
furthermore, I have read and observed and watched those who have been in this role before me, so much so that even though I have my own sense of style, I have learned how to step my sock game up for such a time as this. Each candidate, Sue and Steve, bring great gifts to this role, and I respect and acknowledge their vast experiences. Sue and I worked together in campus ministry for many years, and we work well together. Without reservation, I am committed as a servant leader who will provide an array of support for leaders, deacons, pastors, bishops, congregations, and councils by showing love, offering spiritual and juridical wisdom, providing guidance and protection, and governing humbly. I'm a diligent worker who will not be outworked, but as the keeper of the roster, I have learned to be a better example of a healthy leader and take time off to care for myself. In fact, I've got a whole glass of water waiting for me when I get off stage. As I said in my bio, I have pledged my life to lead the church into radical welcome and inclusion for everyone, and especially make room for the oppressed, ethnic-specific, impoverished, differently abled, LGBTQIA plus communities, and all of God's children. However, what you need to know most is I will always be open-minded, flexible, and objectively fair with views that I may not agree with personally, because I'm committed to unity and advancing the kingdom of God or God's reign. Moreover, I will always be passionately deliberate on those matters that necessitate such posture. As the point person for our church for governance and administrative services, with the Office of Secretary as a team, including your interdependent support and prayers, I pledge to ensure a communication system and relationships with you, each of you, that will provide helpful rapid responses to constitutional, legal, and leadership crisis, which is my priority. In this role, I want to support all of Lutheran history, and I will be your secretary who loves and cares for you in Jesus' name. Thank you. I ask the assembly to stand and join together in thanking these three nominees for sharing their vision. Pause for a moment and watch a brief video on Future Directions 2025. You'd like to hear a story about a woman pastor who has influenced my ministry, and that would be a very easy question to answer. Bishop Eaton would be that individual. Not quite 40 years ago, we met as volunteers at Camp Moana in Mansfield, Ohio. And that was probably about three months after she had been ordained and I was still contemplating seminary. She was the first woman pastor that I really got the chance to know, the first one I ever heard preach, and she has been not only a friend, but a colleague in ministry, also served as my synod bishop in the Northeastern Ohio Synod, and of course she is now everybody's bishop. And her leadership style and the posture from which she leads is still very much a template for how it is that I take upon myself the mantle of congregational leadership. We were bunk mates in Oneida for you Camp Moana people. That's one summer. Thank you. As we move into the fourth ballot for secretary, I call on Asia Favors to give a report from the, from the Credentials Committee. She, the, the counselor has her track shoes on, so she's... <laughs> As of 2.05 p.m., there are 932 voting members registered for this assembly. Thank you for that report. On the fourth ballot, if a nominee receives 60% of the votes cast, that person will be elected secretary. We will again be using the electronic voting machines. I now ask the names of the three nominees to appear on the screen. As you will note, these are in order of the vote total. 
Let me read them to you. Sue Rothmeyer, Stephen Herr, Lamont Wells. Don't vote yet. When we move to the balloting process, you'll be asked to vote for one name. I remind you once again that if you make a mistake and hit the wrong button, simply press the correct number and the voting system will only recognize the last vote you entered. We will be reporting the results of the fourth ballot for the secretary as soon as they are available. I ask the chair of the elections committee to read them and they will also appear on the screen. Are there any questions at this point? There can be no interruptions once voting has begun. We will begin by singing Come Holy Spirit, found on page 14. And then I'll ask Hans, Pastor Hans Becklin to lead us in prayer. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, you are in our midst. You guide us with your leading, with your prodding, with your word. Help us in this moment to call the one whom you are calling to the office of secretary in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Help us to know your will for this church and your will for this servant, whose name you know. All this we ask in the name of the one who was and is and is to come, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please take your voting machines. Please enter the number by the name of the nominee for whom you wish to vote. You may vote now. Voting is closed. I declare the fourth ballot for the secretary to be closed. While we wait for the results, let's watch another video. I love cantering. I became a canter at my church in Denver. And the joy of cantering is not standing up there being, you know, I am now leading you in song. You can't, you cannot lead people in song if you aren't having the rest of the congregation. So the joy of opening your arms in front of a congregation to lead them in a, in a back and forth liturgy that allows you to connect, ah, oh, that's, that, that is the church. That's, that's us and them. And it doesn't matter that I'm behind a table or near a table or in a fancy robe. It's the fact that we are connecting in God's word and saying, help, save, deliver us, protect us, forgive us, all those things we need to cry out every week. We just get to do it in song. I now call on Tom Cunniff for the report of the fourth ballot for secretary. Good afternoon. There were 906 votes cast. Needed to elect on this ballot was 544. May we see the results, please. There is no election. Thank you. 
According to the rules of a procedure, the two persons receiving the highest number of votes on this ballot will proceed to the next ballot. These persons are Lamont Wells and Sue Rothmeyer. I remind you that the fifth ballot for secretary will take place later in this plenary session. Thank you, Mr. Conniff. We will now follow up on the remaining constitutional amendments recommended by the Church Council regarding proposed general amendments to the constitutions, bylaws, and continuing resolutions, resolutions of the ELCA. Please go to the amendments um, of the constitutions of the ELCA document in section five of your pre-assembly report. Many of these proposed amendments are technical in nature and are made as part of the periodic review of the governing documents of this church. Some intend to improve and clarify existing processes. Others are in response to input from congregations and synods, as well as the recommendations from the Entrance Right Discernment Working Group. Prior to the deadline that the Assembly adopted, the following provisions were removed from en bloc consideration. Constitutional provision, right one 7.41.03 Constitu constitutional provision 5.01 constitutional provision 7.52 bylaw 7.31.02 bylaw 7.61.02 constitutions for synods s14.12 constitutions for constitution for synods s1432 Model Constitution for Congregations, C903. Model Constitution for Congregation, C923. Bylaw 7.71.02. I move the action on the top of page one on the amendments related to the Constitution, bylaws, and continuing resolutions of the ELCA to adopt in block with the exception of such amendments as may be separately considered the following amendments to the Constitution, bylaws, and continuing resolutions of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and to authorize the Office of the Secretary to make appropriate changes in the Constitution for synods and the model Constitution of congregations congruent with the ELCA Constitution as amended. Thank you. We will now proceed to vote on the en bloc motion. It takes, pardon me, point of order, microphone, one. Two. 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 Fine. I'm sorry, I didn't hear it here quite this quick, so I didn't bring my little card. I'm Dale Sandstrom from uh, Western North Dakota, a former chairman of the Constitutional, Re uh, Constitutional Review Committee of this, of this church. In fact, this morning, by a two-thirds vote, the body voted to pull out 5.01. I know the person stated that this afternoon she, that wasn't what she meant to move, but that is what she meant but she did move. I wish to separately discuss 5.01 because I think it has an important, uh, important consideration for this entire body and this entire church. And so I raise the point of order that we have separately voted to pull out 5.01. I have no objection if they also want to make a motion to pull out what they intended to pull out. Thank you. I'll have the secretary give a response. As the bishop read, we have already said 5.01 will be used for separate and consideration and is not part of this M block action. Thank you. Thank you. All right, it takes two thirds for adoption. Are you ready to vote? Vote one, pardon me, microphone 11. Uh, thank you. Is this, we can debate this, right? Who, who are you? I am Logan Lee from the Southeast Iowa Synod. Mm -hmm. Are you debating a specific on block motion or the whole notion of on block voting? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, a specific motion within the block. That's not possible. Okay, never mind. Okay, it had to be pulled off earlier, sorry. All right, now, do I have everybody good? I, I would motion. Where, wait, hold on, where are you? Okay, uh, microphone two. Uh, because of the order of consideration, I, you have I to would tell also, us, I'm sorry, you have to tell us who you are. Yes, Dale Sands from Western North Dakota. Thank you. Uh, and I would, uh, if possible, I would move that we also separate out for separate consideration the parallel provision to 5.01, which is 9.21. Mr. Secretary? We have had deadlines all week when the deadlines to remove for consideration were made, and those deadlines have passed. 
Those memorial or those rep parts of the Constitution that were removed will be considered separately. The Constitution also allows that the Office of the Secretary may editorially correct the chain oversights that may have been, so that 5.01 is changed and there are others that were not pulled that, will, that need to reflect that change. They would be reflected at that time, so it is not necessary to change them. But we cannot pull out additional items from the Constitution and bylaws included in a block unless they met the deadline of earlier this week and have already been identified as those that have been removed. Thank you. Now, you're ready to vote. If you're in favor, press 1. Opposed, press 2. Please vote now. Voting is closed. Let's see the results. Calm, calm down here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. We will now turn to the amendments that were removed from the on block resolutions. I will call the numerical designation of the item. If the person who removed it from on block consideration wishes to make a comment or an amendment, please proceed to a microphone. We will then take a separate vote on this provision. Each one requires a two-thirds vote. Bishop, the first one removed is provision 4.02C, the Constitution, Bylaws, and Continuing Resolutions of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Thank you. Is there any speaking to this? <laughs> Microphone three. Matthew Brockmeyer, Greater Milwaukee Synod. This is one of several items that I asked for separate consideration for. The main point here is that I am looking to reinstate or to extend the use of the word oppressed in place of what has been recommended, which is powerless. Uh, we have, up until this point, called for clergy members of the roster of leadership, to speak publicly to the world in solidarity with the poor and oppressed in subsequent and related provisions. The key words that will be part of the other provisions, six parallel provisions that have to do with the call to roster leaders, now will be standing with the poor and powerless and I find that powerless does not really speak to the needs of this church in this moment. All week we have been hearing presentations, we have been marching, we have been speaking to the oppressed. If we backtrack in our governing documents, which are a living representation of how this church is going to do business, I think we will have lost something important. And so I would urge that all of these related provisions be changed from the proposed language to return to standing with the poor and oppressed. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone four. Felicia Boone, Vice President, Minneapolis Area Senate. I'd like to make a motion to amend. Please go ahead. I would like to change the word equality to equity. Is there a second? You may speak to your amendment. Equality speaks to resources, and equity speaks to outcomes, and if we are going to discuss caring for and embracing, I would like to see the outcome, that we discuss it in terms of outcomes. Thank you. Is there any further speaking to the amendment to the re resolution? 
Ah, I call on the reference and counsel committee. Jim. Hi, in reference to motion J from the reference and counsel commi uh, committee, the committee's recommendation is that all of these items be recommended to the office of the secretary. Microphone eight. Craig Satterley, Northwest Lower Michigan Synod. Bishop Eaton, um, I may be the only legally blind person in the room, but I can neither see the screen, and it's Friday, and I'm having trouble keeping up in the guidebook. Would it be permissible for the secretary, in addition to reading the number of the citation, reading the line, or giving us some indication of what we're talking about. I'm afraid my knowledge of the ELCA Constitution is not as fluent as my knowledge of the Northwest Lower Michigan Synod Constitution. Thank you. I think we can do that. Thank you, Liz. You're welcome, Craig. But it's not powerless now. It's powerless now. Bishop, I would note that the, con the amendment, the process for amending constitutions says that the church council may propose an amendment six months in advance of the assembly, and the assembly, by a two-thirds vote, may adopt them. What is in yellow, and I'm sorry, Bishop, uh, in your guidebook it, it would be underlined, is the um, report from the church council. What the voting member is suggesting is we change the word powerless, which is already part of the provision and would be a new, new thought being brought here today. If this is adopted, and it can be by a two-thirds vote, it would also need to come back in 2022 for ratification because it was not part of the initial recommendation coming from church council. All right, and there's more. Because we have an amendment properly on the floor to change equality to equity. Does that fall in the same category? <laughs> Equality is part of the proposed amendment from the church council, so there that was already up for amendment. We can we can work with that one, but it's the sections that we're not recommending a change to that cannot be changed without it being going forward to two years from or three years from now. So this one, the equity piece, let me check with the attorney. This is a point where someone someone who is trained in theology should not be making this call. I think that our faith draws us into community. It's nearly impossible for it not to. Uh, to be able to say, you know, use words of Jesus, Jesus gathered community around him all of the time. And so our faith draws us into community. Our faith invites us into these relationships and these opportunities to do more together than we could ever do alone. Thank you, it is 2.30. So we need to call the orders of the day. Microphone five. Um, I just had a quick point of order about the press because the movement was actually never made. He had a speech before he suggested it. So I believe it's out of order. Did he really? He never moved it, oh. nor did anyone else. The next person stood up and talked about equity over equality. So a press should probably go back to powerless. 
And if I need to do that after we do the orders. Yeah, yeah. So on the floor, by the process that had been pulled, and we were bringing them forward as for separate consideration, they were already moved in that process. So a motion to move the First Amendment, the the uh, oppressed amendment, or the motion to change to oppression, came through the process. That motion is made. Point of order. Point of order. Five. Two. No, that's still me. That's not you. Sorry. Two. Yes, um, please. I, I would disagree with what I just heard. What my understanding is what happened here is we had someone speaking on the, the, the motion. I mean, on the, um, the line item, somebody made a motion. We were at the motion when the third party came up from the stage. So we should still be in a motion conversation. Okay, what we're going to do now, it is the orders of the day. We're going to bring forth the next one, and we're going to sort this out uh, in, in the meantime. Thank you very much. So, okay. the orders of the day, as clarified by the voting member, was that to speak or to address the proposed amendments to 5.01 of the ELCA Constitution, and that would be what would be, for us, be before us now. The motion on the floor, if you would, would be the Church Council recommendations to amend 5.01. Could you read um, the relevant part? Thank you. The person who moved to uh, remove this from on block may approach the microphone if she would wish to speak. Please, Secretary Berger. My concern is Bishop 5.01 has goes through A through J, and there are several amendments in that. I'm not sh sure which one the maker of the. the well, then let's hear, hear from her first. This is going to be microphone 11. So this is. Pastor Jess Felici, West Virginia, Western Maryland Synod. This is what I was speaking to at the beginning of this plenary session. I misspoke when I said 5.01, and what I meant to say was Okay. And, and, and Bishop Eaton, I wish to discuss the item she removed. Microphone two. No, hold on. Don't discuss anything not. yet. We're we're. Um, who pulled five point oh one? Oh. Uh, microphone three. Reverend Gwendolyn King, Southeast Pennsylvania Senate. I am the one who removed the entire section, 5.01, for consideration of this assembly because I felt that a discussion was necessary before moving on to an assembly vote. No matter what section it is, I have some particular concerns about a particular section, but I know that others have other concerns in this. And I wanted it before the assembly prior to a vote. That's why I removed it. That's good. That's fine. Don't go away, Pastor. Um, so here we are. I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but I have a parliamentarian secretary, two sec two lawyers, and um, a, a member, a former member of the West, uh, the North Dakota um, Supreme Court, who will straighten me around. It was the intent. It's true, and it's good. Um, it's the, it was the intention of 
the pastor from West, Western Maryland, West, West Virginia, West Maryland, that, that, that at this time we would talk about that. Yours has also been pulled. Yes. So if we talk about this really fast, we could go on, and I don't know if we're allowed to do this, I have to take the consent of the house. If you'd be willing to let her go first and you come second. I have no problem with that. Okay, and it's also up to the house. Thank you, thank you, Pastor. Where, where does 5.01, which the order of the day is, come up then in that proceed, that order? It'll come next. It comes next. Thank you. No, no. Now we're just. Now we're going to go to. Hold on. All right. Microphone 11, and now let's be very clear which one we're talking about. Secretary Berger? Please, microphone three, point of order. If we are to discuss 7.52, I'm the one who pulled that from unblocked, so I'd like to speak to it first. But my, you, I'm sorry, my name is Paul Erickson, Greater Milwaukee Center. That's fine. That's, I did not pull it. Okay, microphone three. Okay, uh, Paul Erickson, Greater Milwaukee Synod, he, him, his. But I realized that this important item, which talks about the ordination of deacons, was part of the unlock. I thought it was something that we needed to pull so that we could have a conversation on the floor uh, of this assembly. I recognize that significant work has gone in uh, to the recommendations of the entrance right discernment group. Um, I'm grateful for their work and I hope we can hear from them as we have this conversation. Um, I also, however, listened to the deacons in my synod and others, and I've probably heard many concerns about potential for confusion uh, resulting from this change from consecration of deacons to ordination of deacons. I also participated in the hearing the other night and heard many deacons express their concerns if we don't make this change. And I heard them share their stories, and I really hope we hear some of those stories at this time. It seems to me that it boils down to, at least in part, the desire to recognize and affirm the important work done by our deacons while maintaining the distinction between the two rosters, word and service and word and sacrament. Unfortunately, we often fall prey to what some might refer to as clericalism, in which ministers of word and sacrament are deemed as more important than ministers of word and service, not just distinct from. Uh, to be honest, I'm not convinced that simply using the same word, the same entrance rite of ordination will address this issue of clericalism, which we do need to address. I'm not sure this is the way to do it. Fundamentally, I think it always comes down, at least for me, to this question. How can we best promote and enhance the church's engagement in God's mission? If the mission of the gospel is enhanced by ordaining deacons, then let's do it. I'm just not convinced that that's the case. I am open to being convinced and I look forward to this conversation. Thank you. Point of order. Microphone five. Right. Microphone five. Alyssa Dalkey, Metropolitan Chicago Synod. Earlier, there was a request from um, a, from Bishop Satterley, a sibling of ours with low vision, to please read the um, relevant area of the Constitution prior to discussion, and I just um, urge the chair to do that, please. Thank you. Microphone seven. Uh, yes, I had a question about this. My name is Carrie Hovland from the Southern Ohio Synod. And my question is, what are we trying to accomplish by changing the entrance right into the ministry of word and sacrament? I ask because I was ordained into the ministry of word and sacrament in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Tanzania, the Northern Diocese, where the right of ordination or kuberakiwa is used for various calls within the church. And so, I am not objecting to the right of ordination, but will it achieve its intended purpose? And I ask because from what I have seen in the last four years of my rostered ministry within the ELCA, is that there is a poor understanding of the different functions between the ministry of word and sacrament and the ministry of word and service. I have also seen the blurring of these two very distinctive calls to ministry. How do we educate, lift up, and celebrate these two equally important and yet vastly different calls within our church. If we are to adopt the right of ordination for all rostered ministers, 
Does it help us as a church to clarify and better understand when someone when someone's call to the ministry changes from word and service to word and sacrament or from word and sacrament to word and service? I ask because I have seen ministers of word and sacrament functioning in service roles out in the world as a bridge between the church and the world, and I have seen ministers of word and service functioning in roles where they are consecrating and administering the sacraments. And so my question is, what is it that we are trying to achieve by changing this entrance rite, and will a change in the entrance rite wording help to achieve it? Thank you. Microphone four. You switched over to microphone three. Okay. I'm a confusing person. <laughs> Bishop Mark Narum, Western North Dakota Synod, uh, co-chair of the Entrance Right Discernment Group. As I understand it, because I thought a, um, I thought amendment was going to come that was going to change this. That's why I'm being confusing and jumping over here. I stand firmly in support of the word ordained. Um, and I did not come into this group with that feeling. I came in ambivalent at best. In one of the first meetings, I asked if we were really just talking about how many angels can dance on the head of a needle. But over time, in deep conversation, in looking at the entrance rites, but most importantly, in listening to the deacons of this church, they cry out for respect. This may only be one step down the path toward respect for the deacons of this church. But brothers and sisters in Christ, let's take a step and then together let's start running. Because Christ is calling us to the kind of ministry where we would get up out of our chairs, please out of this assembly hall, and go out into the streets to proclaim the love of Jesus Christ in deed. Please vote for ordination. Thank you. Mark, microphone 11. Pastor Jelaine Markle, Southeastern Iowa Synod, she, her, hers. My fellow siblings in Christ that are or will be ministers of word and service, I am sorry. I beg of your forgiveness. When I first read this language, I was very angry. I was holding on so strongly to language that the Holy Spirit had to hit me over the head with a spiritual two by four. My anger came from a place of fear. My anger and admittedly confusion was about me only. I felt my call was threatened when in reality, that was so far from the truth. My fear and anger came from my own insecurities and I was wrong. I am another English major and I of all people should know that words matter. Deacons are a gift to this church. Their ministry to the church and the greater world is essential to kingdom building. Ordaining deacons does not invalidate my ordin own ordination. Thanks, Northern Texas, Northern Louisiana. Ordaining deacons only infirms the work we do together as the ELCA and with our ecumenical partners. If you are afraid that this language is gonna do this, then I invite you to lean into the revised common lectionary for this Sunday and do not be afraid. Language matters. Deacons, you matter. And I am so sorry. And I give thanks to God for your ministry because mine is better because of it. Thank you. Microphone 12. What point of order? Question? Yes, microphone one. Peter Metcalf, Montana Synod. And my question is this, or point of order, is I'm concerned that we're voting on a constitutional change that we may vote opposite for, or we may vote an opposite on the constitutional change of the document we're concerning, considering later. And that seems to me that we're possibly in some sort of order mismatch here. And I would like to know if there needs to be some either tying of the constitutional amendment decision to that other document that we'll be considering or some other order to the order in which we do this. It seems. Could you tell us what other document that is? Aren't we voting on the, the right of ordination regarding um, deacons later in the no, assembly? This. Mr. Secretary? You will be doing that by voting on the constitutional amendments, i.e. this one. There will not be a special vote on ordination. We will make that determination as we vote on the constitutional amendments that identify ordination. So you're voting on that at this point. Thank you for clarifying that for me and anybody else who is confused. Thank you very much. Microphone 12. 
Pastor Chris from Delaware, Maryland Synod, I only stand at a red microphone because it was the closest empty microphone. I was rising for a similar reason as was just raised for a parliamentary inquiry because there is a motion from the, or to the referencing council that was made to change this from ordination to consecration. So in front of us is the recommendation of the council to use the word ordained in replace of received onto the roster, but there is another motion brought to the referencing council committee that asked for it to be changed from ordination to consecration. So I was asking for some clarity on what will happen if we approve this with that motion that was made to reference the council. Thank you, let's find out. I mean, let's him find out. 7.52 proposes changing received onto the roster with the word ordained. If someone would like to change that to the word consecrated, they would need to stand now and move the amendment. I understand that was received by reference and counsel. Reference and counsel could move that. I would point out, though, that that then need will need to be ratified in 2022. Right. Microphone five. Sister Michelle Collins, deacon serving in the Florida Bahamas Synod. I speak in favor of this language. Each of us on the rosters of this church have different stories about how we felt, responded to, and accepted the call to public ministry in the ELCA. For most of us, I would imagine it has something to do with being compelled by the gospel and wanting to impact others. What excites me about ministers of word and service being ordained is not about my journey, how I got onto the roster, or what deacons being ordained may or may not do for me. What excites me is thinking about the 12-year-old who will be formed in a church that ordains ministers of word and service and ministers of word and sacrament for service and leadership in both the church and the world, unified in call but distinct and, and unique in expression. This church does not have a transitional diaconate. It excites me that a 12-year-old will be formed in a church where deacons have gone all the way. My hope is that having the same right of entrance for rostered ministers will continue to create for that 12-year-old a church that lifts up both pastors and deacons as ministers, that actively and intentionally encourages all people, lay people and rostered ministers, to live out their vocations from their baptism, claimed and sent for the sake of the world. Having the same right of entrance strengthens the mutual support and accountability pastors and deacons have for each other as partners in ministry and leaders in this church. It also makes a statement to the church and the world about our common call to word, service, and sacrament. For the sake of God's mission, as we continue to be a church that boldly moves into the margins, consistently calls and sets apart people, and passionately celebrates the diversity of gifts and callings, I hope we ordain ministers of word and service. Thank you. Microphone 9. Tom Drubina, Slovak Zion Synod. Reverend Chair, I rise to speak in favor of the proposed amendment. As a person of roster, I also worry about clericalism, but I do not believe that the question at hand is one of clericalism or of blurring ministries or gifts, but I believe the historic language of ordination to be faithful, faithful to the intent of this church in entrusting these siblings with the symbols and responsibilities, faithful to the witness of scripture and the traditions of the apostles, and faithful to that which the Holy Spirit is doing when these persons are set apart for service in the liturgy of the church. It is my prayer that by embracing this little word, we might acknowledge the work of the Holy Spirit by faithfully naming that beautiful liturgy of the church and not simply by adding names to a list in Chicago. Thank you. I know, hold on. There's something else going on. No, microphone four. Four. Microphone four. Paul Erickson, Greater Milwaukee Synod. I apologize for the confusion. The previous motion had not made, did not need to be separately made, but was on the floor by, by the committee. I had submitted language to change the word ordained to consecrated. So that's why I now, hopefully this is not going to count as a speech, but we'll invalidate. I, I move to amend the language from ordained to consecrated. There is a second. 
Point of order call. Yes, please. I'll take your time. Come on over to a microphone. That's good. Please. I know. I understand that there have been four speakers. Sorry, no, no, that's a speech. No, 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 not, okay. So the point of order is that a speech before the... the, the that was a speech before the motion. It's a rationale. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that clarification. So here we are. We have had four uh, speakers in favor of the resolution as presented. Uh, Bishop Erickson, uh, in error, uh, did not uh, the first time uh, make the correct, uh, did not make the, uh, the amendment, and now he's made a speech, as you pointed out, and made an amendment. So I'm going to rule this out of order. So what are we going to be actually voting on? Is Thank the question. You. That's a great question, Mr. Secretary. It's the proposal of the church council. You can. Microphone three. And don't speak first, just say move to challenge. Okay. I move to challenge the ruling of the chair, Paul Thank Erickson, you. Greater Milwaukee Senate. Thank you very much. Is there a second to that? Second. second. And now he can speak to that, right? Ask your parliamentarian. <laughs> Okay, yes, you may you may speak to that. I What's that? Wait, hold on. What? It has been seconded. Okay, please, B Bishop, sorry. I humbly apologize to the Assembly for not being expert in these rules of procedure. My intent was simply that we have a conversation and that if it is the will of the Assembly to, to affirm ordination of deacons, that we have a strong vote to do so. The only way in which to record that vote is to have this motion in front of us, which I thought had been made uh, based on the previous experience of the, uh, the previous amendment. So I apologize for the confusion and adding to it. But I would like this uh, to be considered and have a strong vote one way or the other. Thank you. Besides, I was the one who told you you could challenge the chair, so we're in this together. <laughs> Is there any discussion about the challenge to the ruling of the chair? Any more discussion about that? No? Then the motion before you is, do you wish to uphold the ruling of the chair? If you wish to uphold my ruling, you would press one. If you wish, if you're not in favor of that, you would press two. Okay, I, okay, good, with some explanation, not a problem. Um, so, uh, we have this resolution before us. Um, Four people spoke in favor of the resolution. Our rules are that when four people have spoken in a row in favor of the resolution, then it's automatically the, 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 the debate ends and we move to a vote. Bishop Erickson s said he spoke in error. He believed he had already moved, uh, that this had already been moved to change ordination to consecration. It had not. And then Bishop Erickson made a motion, but he made a speech before he did it. I therefore ruled his um, amendment from ordination to consecration out of order. He's challenged my decision, and we are voting now whether or not to hold the, the decision of the chair, me, or if we want to uh, overturn the decision of the chair. So if you vote one, you uphold the, the, the decision of the chair that his amendment is out of order. If you vote two, you vote the other way. Do you, is, is that, do you understand that? Okay, very good. So one for uphold, two for overthrow. <laughs> Please vote now. Thank you. The vote is closed. Let's see the results. 
The ruling of the chair is upheld. Thank you. So now we need. So we all clear where we are? We're in 752. This is properly before you as the amended version from the church council, which says to change to receive, oh, there it is, uh, that um, the matter prescribed in the documents of this church, who has been properly called and ordained. This is 7.52. A minister of word and service of this church shall be a person whose commitment to Christ soundness in the faith, aptness to serve, teach, and witness, and educational qualifications have been example, examined and proved in the manner prescribed in the documents of this church, who has been properly ordained. That's the change, and that's, that's what we are voting on now. Are we clear? Okay, I think, I think is there any more comment? No, we can't, I'm sorry. All right, um, I think we're ready to vote, vote one. He's just getting his voting machine. Vote huh? <laughs> <laughs> one in favor, two opposed. Please vote now. And the two thirds vote is required. Voting is closed. Let's see the results. It's adopted. Thank you. I think we've completely lost the idea that we weren't going to applaud or not. Um, yeah, so I just hold on a minute, please, Pastor. Uh, we, we need to be mindful that, that, that some, some siblings disagree with the action taken, and we need to be respectful to them as well. Please, microphone nine, point of order. Reverend Chair, I move to suspend the rules of this assembly, which interfere with the consideration of a motion, which would provide clarity for what we just did and guidance for moving into the future together. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. You may speak to it. It was my counsel that uh, this isn't spoken to, but I think it's a good idea. Okay, thank you. What, what's the, what would be the effect, Pastor Debrina? Pardon? What would be the effect of this? The effect would be that I would bring forward a motion, the text of which would say that this assembly direct the office of the presiding bishop in consultation Wait, hold with... Wait, You know what? I don't want you to be disqualified by giving a speech. Why, could you just come up here really quickly and explain what we're doing? It's okay. We just all, I, I can't hear, so <laughs> if you could do that silently, that's okay. That's all right.
There's a motion on, a on the floor to suspend the rules, uh, and then the, uh, if should the, the rules be suspended to allow this to be brought forward, then we would be talking about a, um, a motion uh, that would, a, a subsequent motion. That, I'm sure, was not clear at all. <laughs> I'm, I'm, here we go again. We, we have to vote on the motion to suspend, whether or not to suspend debate. Um, the, uh, the motion that Pastor is bringing forward, I believe, is non-germane and is part of new business. And that's precluded my, that's, if he suspends the rules, that's, he can do it, right? Okay, so we're voting on a motion. To, could you read your motion again, please, Pastor? I move to suspend the rules of this assembly temporarily, which interfere with the consideration of a motion, which would provide clarity for what we just did and guidance for our moving together into the future. That's moved and seconded it's before us. Um, I don't think... Okay, that's what he's asking the assembly to determine um, whether or not this is really a legitimate time to suspend the rules temp temporarily in order to entertain this motion, which he believes will be beneficial. So, vote one to suspend the rules. This takes a two-thirds vote. Vote two not to, to disallow suspension of the rules temporarily at this point. Are we clear? One, to suspend the rules temporarily. Two, to continue as we're, as we've been going on. Okay? Please vote now. Voting is closed. Let's see the result. The motion to suspend has been defeated. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I lost the teleprompter. I, I don't, I'm, I'm, ah, there we are. No. I think we have some more that we from remove from on block. Oh, I'm sorry. The, we're, now what comes up next, actually, is a report 5.01. We said we'd discuss next 5.01, which is, take your time, Pastor. I'm opposed. Am I recognized or who? No, we're, we're going we're gonna to hear again what... Okay, thank you. And then just don't go away, though. Microphone three. Go ahead, please. Uh, Reverend Gwendolyn King, Southeast Pennsylvania Senate. I placed before this uh, august body this removal of the 5.01 because I felt that the move to include ministers of word and service as rostered leaders within this church body is important and necessary. As I reviewed the documents, however, it seemed that moving the ministry of word and service to just rostered status without intentional representation was not enough. Their voice is important and needs to be heard. Word and service ministers not just serve in congregations, but they also serve in hospitals, schools, administration, campus ministry, just social service, just to name a few. I simply wanted this body to discuss the representation, which appears in several areas in this section, before moving a, to a vote, so that we could make sure of the intentional desire of rostered ministers of word and service within that particular status. 
on our constitutional block. That's Thank why. you. Um, microphone two, did you have a point of order? No, I wanted to speak. Uh, okay, hold to on. The, we've got a point. Time. I think we've got a point of order at eight, and then please go ahead. Microphone eight. Matthew Hazard, Southern Ohio Synod. I have a question. Can we pray? We have not prayed in quite a while, and we made some big decisions. So, can you please lead us in prayer? Certainly. Thank you. Lord, sometimes we're distracted with much serving. So give us quiet now, peace in our hearts. We know you're present. Open us to be aware of your presence. Lord, a, a well-grounded, quiet Mary helps a very functioning Martha to get work done. Please be with us as we continue these deliberations. Amen. Microphone two. Thank you, Dale Sandstrom, Western North Dakota. My concern with the change to 5.01 is in subpart D, where it says that each congregation, synod, and, and synod in its governing documents shall include confession of faith, statement of purpose, and, com and components as required in the Constitution, bylaws, and continuing resolutions of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. That's the language proposed to change. My concern is, and my opposition to this, is that this would require that congregations and synods across, throughout the church place in their, con in their documents, their, con their own constitutions, anything required by continuing resolutions of this church. Continuing resolutions of this church do not have to, are not limited to being approved by this churchwide assembly. A two-thirds vote of the church council can establish continuing resolutions. Thus, the church council, without coming to the churchwide assembly, would be able to uh, create requirements of provisions of the constitutions of every congregation and every synod of this church. I don't know that that was what was intended, but that is the effect. And so I oppose, I'm opposing all of 5.01. The parliamentarian and legal counsel tell me I could amend this, in which case it would not be effective and come back at the next churchwide assembly. So thus it seems the simplest is just simply to defeat this provision uh, and uh, then it can, uh, something appropriate can come back at the next churchwide assembly. Thank you. You want to speak to that? Currently, the language requires that the mandatory provisions of the Constitution, bylaws, and continuing resolutions of the ELCA in certain provisions are required. In the Synod Constitution, those are the ones with the cross dagger. In the Congregational Constitutions, those are the ones with the asterisk. What we are doing here is trying to clean up the language so we, we didn't know what a structural component was as opposed to just a regular component. We dropped the word structural. We then, instead of saying this constitution, used its name so that we were clear. At the moment, nor has there ever been a required continuing res a, a re mandatory continuing resolution. In fact, for congregations, congregations are requested or are called to do this, but it still takes a vote of a majority members of voting and president in an annual meeting for those amendments to be made. There are congregations in this church that have never amended their constitution. That will be a problem, but that is in fact the case. Synods, required portions automatically are changed at the time of notification but those are, there are no continuing resolutions, and to the best of my knowledge, there are no bylaws that are required from the ELCA Constitution going into a Synod Constitution. I could be wrong on that one. Thank you. Microphone 10. I have a question about item D on the word constitutions. I believe the ELCA has only one constitution several bylaws and several con resolutions. So I think the Constitution should be singular. Let's explain that to you, please, Mr. Secretary. 
The constitutions of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America are the constitution of the ELCA, the constitution for synods, and the model constitution for congregations. Those make up the constitutions of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Okay, because the language it's replacing is singular. That's so right. you understand the confusion. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Any further speaking? Clarity. In what the hold on. secretary just said. Hold, hold on, where are we? Which microphone? Microphone one. Microphone one. The bishop, I mean, the secretary just read, and the words are quite clear components as required, which would mean that they are required. Mr. Secretary? They are required. Okay, so that well, let, me, let, me, let me finish. The way in which they are required, still because congregations are separate legal entities, require the congregation to, uh, uh, to approve them before they go into effect in the Constitution. And that's why I'm saying there are congregations that have not modified their constitutions, nor is there provision for disciplining them for doing that, other than dealing with the particular problems they could run into using a different process. Okay, and I understand what you're saying, but what I'm saying to you is on paper it does say that they are required to do so. If they chose not to do it, that's another discussion. I think it's the mechanism in which the requirement is carried out in congregations. And that would be, if I'm wrong, Mr. Secretary, so they're required to do this, and they're required to do it by taking a congregational vote. But they don't. It doesn't. They might not pass it. Okay. Does it help? I'm sorry. Yeah, it actually. But it so it is there, but there is a way to bypass it. Yes. When I was Synod Bishop, where Bishop Allende is now, there are still um, constitutions in German, and one constitution actually had what they called the unamendable clause. It's like the unforgivable curse in Harry Potter, right? Uh, <laughs> microphone seven. Deacon Aaron Power, she, her, hers. I'm speaking in favor, in particular speaking to 501G. As a minister of Warden Service, I take seriously the responsibility outlined for me in our governing documents and the promises I made at my consecration to work to equip the baptized for ministry and encourage mutual relationships that invite participation in God's mission. Our call as deacons is to make space for lay leaders to join directing the vision and work of this church. Today, that looks like deacons joining our Warden Sacrament colleagues and how we are represented in church assemblies and committees to more fully allow our non-rostered leader voices to be heard. It also means that my synodical colleagues and myself will have work to do. We will have work to do to adjust how we elect lay leaders, pastors, and deacons to make sure we have the diverse voices we need, which isn't new. We figured out how to make space for youth and young adults. We've intentionally made space for people of color and whose language, first language is not English. We in the Rocky Mountain Synod have already begun this work, which is why I stand before you today. We have done the work to make space for our ministers and more than service. So if you're worried about how to do this, don't worry. We're church together. We got your back. Thank you. We've now come to 315. I'm calling the orders of the day, which is the report of the, sec of the, uh, the elections committee on the election of the secretary. He's saying something here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the fifth ballot, I'm sorry, I'm most awfully sorry. We're moving to the fifth ballot for, the, for secretary. All voting members should be in their seats at this time. I call on Asia Favors to provide a report from the Credentials Committee. And 
I think about the theology of the cross, you know, that, that life isn't pretty, that, that following Jesus is, is messy. We, we get real messy out here, and I think that um, helps us get to the heart of, of who we're called to be as disciples. Um, and I love that about, about this place, um, that, that we, are, we are at the heart of being Lutheran. As we acknowledge creation and we acknowledge the messiness of life, uh, we see that firsthand here. One time only, who would like to go to the microphone and tell what's the most exciting mission moment that's happening in your congregation, agency, institution, college, or university right now? Don't hurt each other. <laughs> microphone seven. Oh. So, Don't my go name away. is Carrie Hovland from the Southern Ohio Synod, and we are right outside of Dayton where we have had tornadoes hit as well as now a shooting, and we are looking at bringing Camp Noah from Lutheran Social Services in Minnesota into not only our congregation, but into congregations in the Dayton area. And we are looking for support um, because one of these camps costs $25,000. So please be on the lookout um, for this to come up on their website, and please support us in this important work about okay, helping that, children. Okay, that's a mission minute. You've got it. Thank you. Good point. All right, five. We'll just let five. And this is it. Sally Hansen from Chicago Metro Synod. Um, we have, are the first church in the country to work together with Project Healing Waters. It is a... Uh, uh, ministry with, that works with a federal medical facility, in this case the one that is on Great Lakes, a church, and a professional fly fishing in which we work with our vets on a weekly to monthly basis as well as with um, the recreational therapists as a way to provide ministry to a number of vets in our world. This was the first time that the federal medical facility was willing to work with a religious institution and has now spread throughout um, the country as an opportunity to be able to be church and a government as one. Thank you very much. Very good. As of 2.50 p.m., the credentials report remains the same with 932 voting members at this assembly. Thank you, Ms. Favors. <laughs> On the fifth ballot, if a nominee receives a majority of the votes, votes cast, that person will be elected secretary. We will again be using the electronic voting machines. I now ask that the names of the two final nominees appear on the screen. As you will note, these are in order by vote total. Let me read them to you. Lamont Wells, Sue Rothmeyer. Do not vote yet. When we move to the balloting process, you will be asked to vote for one person. If you select the wrong button, then press the correct number. We will be reporting the results of the fifth ballot for secretary as soon as they are available and verified. I ask the chair of the elections committee to read them. I'll ask the chair of the elections committee to read them, and they will also appear on the screen. Unless there is a tie, I will declare an election. Are there any questions? Once ballot voting begins, there can be no interruptions. Please, hold, okay. Are you, have you come to a microphone? Microphone six. Alyssa Dalkey, Metropolitan Chicago Synod. I'd like to call for prayer um, prior to the vote. You, well, you, you beat me to it because that's exactly what we're going to do. Oh, thank you for reading my mind. <laughs> Point of order, please. Uh, from, yes, the, from the resource, uh, uh, from the church council. Yes, Pastor. Pastor Jim Ott. It notes that Lamont Wells is listed first, yet he received the second amount of voice. Votes. No, no, he did not. According to the report on the pad. Sorry, my fault. 
Grace abounds, Pastor. All right, let's, let's prepare for this discernment, and we begin by singing Veni Sancti Spiritus, and after that, Bishop Deborah Hutterer of the Grand Canyon Synod will lead us in prayer. Microphone five, please. Let us pray. O Holy One, you have gifted Sue and Lamont with various gifts and skills. As we come to this vote, give all of us, including the two of them, a sense of calm. We come humbly seeking wisdom and direction about the person best suited to serve as secretary of this church at this time and place. Reassure each candidate of their unique gifts and help us, help us listen to who is the best candidate at this time. Help us hear the movement of the spirit. In the name of our peace, Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you. To vote for Lamont Wells, push one. To vote for Sue Rothmeyer, push two. Please vote now. Voting is closed. I declare the fifth ballot for secretary to be closed. We have to, we'll, we'll get the results, but we have to verify them first. I'm really very hopeful as always, because my background has been in church history. And uh, there has always been, it seems to me, something facing the church that a lot of people worry about. But God has always found a way through. And uh, here we are, thousands of years later. So I believe that uh, there will be opportunities ahead. And if we're ready to listen, if we have the leaders to help us see those opportunities, uh, then we have nothing to worry about. God will find a way. Thank you. I'll call on uh, Tom Conniff for the report of this ballot. Final elections report. We had 911 ballots cast. 456 were needed to elect. May we see the results, please. There is an election.
thanks to this assembly. It's, it's not official yet. On the basis of this report and the decision of this assembly, Sue E. Rothmeyer is hereby duly elected to a six-year term as the secretary of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. It's official. <laughs> Thanks to this assembly for entrusting me with this new sense of vocation. And I will covet your prayers and your support and the ways in which we can work together in the days ahead in this role. I'm grateful for parents who instilled a sense of vocation by such good models, both in their sense of parenting and also as the farmer from Iowa and the elementary school teacher who I happen to have as my fourth grade teacher. And tomorrow, my father will be here for the installation at 8.30, so I invite you to welcome him and to say hello. I'm going to be giving him a call in a few minutes, and friends are going to be bringing him from Iowa. I'm also so grateful for the others who are willing to be identified in this pre-identification process that we use this time, and also for those who were on the stage with me, and particularly for Steve and Lamont, who were here in these last moments. We are friends and we are colleagues, and I'm grateful for their good servanthood in this church. And briefly, I just want to know, say that there are friends and family who are here who have been supportive. You know who you are. I also want to particularly call out my successors in this role. All have mentored me in various and sundry ways, and I can tell you stories. Um, but to Secretary Berger, to David Swartling, who I think might have already had to leave, and to Lowell Allman, I give you thanks, and I look forward to your continued support in this role. And also, the staff of the Office of the Secretary, wherever you might be right now, I would have loved to have had you all come to the stage. They're working. But, <laughs> I know, they're working. So wherever you might be, pop up so that this assembly can receive your thanks. Their, th th this assembly can give you their thanks for all that you have been. And now I think we've got some business to do, so let's get on with it. <laughs> Thank you, Secretary-elect. Now we're going to... All right, so we'll call uh, um, the um, CBCR uh, co-chairs back, and we're going to go back to where we were in line at the last consideration. And uh, Secretary Berger can help me with that. So do we have Jim and Emma? Yeah. Five point oh one. So Emma Wagner and Jim Jennings are making their right way up. Microphone two. I move to amend by striking the changes found in Part D. Is there a second? You may speak to your amendment. No, just streamline in on the area of my particular concern. The Secretary said we've never done anything besides the Constitution if, as requiring con uh, the changes in the uh, con Congregational Synod Constitutions. That may well be. Words have consequences. Currently, it says that the congregations and synods would have to contain stru such structural components as required by the Constitution. The change language would, re would remove the requirement that those re components be limited to structural components and would permit and would require those components required by a continuing resolution of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. 
continuing resolutions can be passed without coming to the churchwide assembly by a two-thirds vote of the church council. I think that's wrong. Thank you. We're at uh, 501D. Each congregation inserted in its governing documents shall include the confession of faith and statement of purpose and such components, structural has been crossed out, or has been stricken, as required and uh, has struck out is th in this constitution and said as it required in the constitutions, bylaws, and continuing resolutions of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. That's the change. Does anyone, anyone else speaking to the amendment to? Not do the change. The amendments to retain the current language and not adopt the proposal exactly. from the church council. So, I was getting there. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. So what we have up there, what's been proposed, that's now being amended to change it back to the original language. Is there any speaking to this? Well, microphone 11. J.J. Lynn, Southwest PA. This might be a moot point depending on how we vote. But if we vote against this amendment, I'm wondering if Secretary Berger could describe he used the word problem just curious with congregations having their own agency to adopt or not adopt or amend or not amend their constitutions to reflect if you could describe what that might be if they don't so we have an idea of what we're going back to thank you for example a, pr a previous version of disciplining of members in chapter 15 said that the congregation council was the judge, the prosecutor, the judge, and the jury, and the, if the person being disciplined wanted to appeal, they could appeal to the synod council. In 2013, we changed that to involve the church, or the congregation council bringing charges to the synod, dis or the synod vice president, involving the synod uh, consultation committee and the synod discipline committee and remove from the synod, count, synod Constitution the ability of the Synod Council to hear appeals. If congregations are using the old version of discipline for members and the member appeals to the Synod Council and the Synod Council can't hear the appeal, all we do is perpetuate the problem. That's one of the areas. There are several, several others in the history of this church that I could provide horror stories, but I'll just leave it at that one and say there are others. Thank you. Microphone four. Rob Malachek, Lindale Lutheran. I would like to speak against the proposed amendment because what we are doing is changing what he, what the amendment is, is to change the language from the title of the document to a word referring to the document. The fact that the previously didn't say anything about continuing resolutions is irrelevant because the continuing resolutions are part of the document that is referred to by the words this constitution. Thank you so much. Thank you. Microphone 8. Nadine Anderson, Northeast Pennsylvania Synod. Uh, we haven't revised our constitution in my congregation in a long time, and I've been working on it for a year. Uh, if it is in the constitution of the ELCA, it only has to go in hours if there's an asterisk by it in the proposed, in the uh, model constitution. Sorry, are you speaking against the amendment or are you asking a question? Uh, I'm suggesting that we don't need this change Thank you. because, go ahead. so I'm against that amendment because okay. it doesn't have to go into our constitution unless there is an asterisk by the item and I haven't seen any asterisks by the, uh, by the, uh, by the anything except the actual constitution. I haven't seen it in the bylaws. I haven't seen it in the continuing resolutions. So I don't think there's any need to make this change. Thank you. Any more speaking to the amendment? All right, the amendment Okay, I think we're ready to vote. The amendment would, would reinsert the language that's there, that had been there. So if you're in favor of the amendment, you would press one. If you're opposed, you would press two. Please press now.
Try it now. Voting is closed. Let's see the results. The amendment fails. So now we're once again 501. at 501. <coughs> Microphone 5. Deacon Stephanie Ludke from the Minneapolis Area Synod. I'm speaking to affirm the words of Deacon Aaron Power regarding Part G when she said that we still have work to do to ensure representation for deacons in the work of our synods and churchwide expressions. I encourage every synod council and the churchwide council to work to ensure that deacons be at the table. This representation has not yet existed everywhere when deacons were considered lay people. I am the only deacon representing the Minneapolis area synod this week and it was not by design. I was on the alternate list because there's no design to ensure representation by deacons. I additionally would like to affirm the changes made in the new Part E uh, to adjust representative percentage of men and women from 50 to 45 percent, which allows for representation of our non-binary siblings in Christ. Good. Thank you very much. Microphone 12. Brian Campbell, child of God, I move that discussion cease and call the question. Is there a second? second. Thank you. You seem ready to vote. In order to close debate, you would press one. In order to continue debate, you would press two. Please vote now. Voting is closed. Let's see the results. Debate is closed. We'll now move on to voting on the 5.01. Okay. So are you ready to vote? Okay. Vote one if you approve. Um, vote vote two if you're not in favor. So one if you're in favor, two if you oppose. Please vote now. This requires two-thirds. Voting is closed. May we see the results? What, what, what? Voting's closed, let's see the results. Okay, it's adopted, thank you. We are now back to 4.02C, and we're gonna have a conference, a sidebar conference here, between the general counsel and the secretary. Let me just say thank you to you. You are doing a tremendous job. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So we have on the screen, and hopefully we can find it in our guidebooks, 4.02C. And this reads, serve in response to God's love to meet human needs caring for the sick and aged, advocating dignity, justice, and equality for all people, working for peace and reconciliation among the nations, caring for the marginalized, embracing and welcoming racially and ethnically diverse populations. That's the change. We, the, the recommendation from uh, um, CBCR is to strike and after the word dignity, 
to add and equality after the word justice, and then following down after and reconciliation among the nations, adding caring for the marginalized, embracing and welcoming racially and ethnically diverse populations. Are you clear what we're, we're talking about right now? Is there any speaking to this? Do you have a point of order? Point of order. Microphone? Point of order. But hold on. Sorry. Where are you? Five. Five. Okay, Hi. microphone five, please. Yes, yeah, quick point of order. Uh, I believe where we left off with this was there was a motion to change equality to equity. Correct. You want to speak in favor? Hold on, hold on, hold on. I think we got really confused about that. We were I, believe, I believe we did. Yes. And I didn't know if you were having your sidebar for the term or for figuring out if we would have to take this back to council to come back to it three years from now. Yes, you're correct. The okay. motion is to change equality, and it was it was uh, passed. Yes, we, no, we have not vote. yet. Have not yet. Yeah. The we second did. the second thing I well, will say. Well, let me be clear then. So if, if okay, so to your point exactly, should the the assembly vote to change? To, to accept the amendment and change equality to equity, in fact, it would have to come back through the 2022 churchwide assembly. But okay. Go ahead. Second point is a press on the screen should not be there because it was never moved to be placed there. You're actually correct. I know. And so... <laughs> It's few and far between, so I'm going to hold on to the ones I have. <laughs> you take it. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Um, so if, uh, if we're back to powerless and only equity is the issue, yes. then we would have another three years before we're actually able to ratify this. Is that correct? Yes. Based on that judgment, do we want to ask the person who originally changed the vocabulary if they still want another three years? You can raise that rhetorically. We'll see if there's any response to that. Thank you. Thanks. Microphone four. All right. Uh, may I have you? No, no, no. You're at three. Oh. She's at four. I'm sorry. Felicia Boone, Minneapolis Area Senate. I still want the word equity on. So if it takes. That's all right. So it's been moved and seconded that the word equity be um, changed, equality changed out, and equity changed in. Okay, microphone three. Uh, I just had a point of clarification about whether we were considering the change to equity in addition to the oppressed and solidarity, which you had indicated before had been properly moved. No, actually the oppressed part was not. There was a speech before that, and so that, that's out of order. All that we're voting on now is whether to change um, equality to equity. May I ask a follow-up on of that? Of course. Uh, the motion, though, had been contained in materials provided to the secretary before the deadline. I'll call on our um, CBCR co-chairs. No. Reference and counsel. Reference and counsel. I'm sorry. Reference and counsel. Most awfully sorry. So the committee had dialogue around that issue, and I believe where we felt that we had left it in consultation with the submitter was that he was actually fine with this being removed to uh, address that issue. For clarity's sake, Bishop, may I suggest we vote on the issue of the amendment on equity, and if the uh, speaker would like to then move, what else is up there on the screen, we then could consider it, but we need to consider them separately and not together. Right. And that's what on, on the, before us on the floor now is a motion to amend equality with equity. If you're in favor of the amendment, please press one. If you're opposed, please press two. Please vote now. Voting is closed. May we see the results? The 
The amendment passes. So now we also, microphone three. Could you reintroduce yourself too, please? Yes, Matthew Brockmeyer, Greater Milwaukee Synod. And I move to replace or to add the words in solidarity with the poor and to remove powerless and replace it with oppressed. Is there a second? Let me speak to your motion again if you want. I don't need that I know that I need to elaborate much, simply that uh, my intent here is to make sure that we continue to stand with the poor and oppressed. Powerless is not as powerful a word. Thank you. Thank you very much. So to be clear, now we are, um, this is 4.02C, and it is, it's all in one sentence. Wow, this is like St. Paul. <laughs> but toward the end, um, we're adding, um, standing in solidarity is being added with the poor and oppressed is being added and powerless, it, it's the, bo bo the motion is to strike powerless. Are we clear about this? Is there any speaking to the amendment? No. All right. You seem ready to vote. Those in favor of the amendment, press one. Those opposed, those opposed two, please vote now. Voting is closed. May we see the result? The amendment is adopted. So now we have, are there any further amendments? No. Then before, we, before us we have, ah. 402C. Yes. The amended Provision 4.02C. Is there any further discussion on this? Hold on, we have a point of order and I think it's going to be at seven. Don't hurt yourself, Pastor Tyke. That, that wouldn't be good. Microphone seven. Nadine Oops. No, wait, did you have a point of order? Nadine Anderson. Wait, 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 wait. sorry, Mrs. Ms. Anderson. There was a point of order. <laughs> it's a high privilege, okay? Ready. Point of order, microphone seven. Andreas Teich, Messiah Lutheran Church, Bay City, Northwest Lower Michigan Synod. My point of order is, I understood the secretary to say that when 4.02C was amended, we could no longer pass it at this assembly. It had to return in 2022, is that correct? No, you ha it has to be adopted by a two-thirds vote at this assembly and then a two-thirds vote at the 2022 assembly to be adopted. But it first needs to be adopted by this, Senate, this assembly. It will not be effective until it is adopted by the 2022 assembly. So the new constitution will not include this item? The current provision unamended will continue. Thank you. Thank you. Now microphone seven again. She had the, did you have the same question, ma'am? Yeah. We've cleared it up then? Okay, is there any more speaking? You seem ready to vote. Good. To vote in favor, press one. Opposed, press two. Please vote now. Voting is closed. Let's see the results. Okay, it's passed. Thank you very much. It's adopted.
The next would be 731-2A8. And on that, reference and council committee has, has one that's been submitted, so I would call, ask them to be called on to present their recommendation. Please, please present the recommendation. This was found as part of Motion J on Guidebook, and the committee's recommendation on this is a referral to the Office of the Secretary. Is there? Go ahead, Mr. Secretary. No, I. Here it comes. If they, the voting referral would refer it back to the office of the secretary, and it obviously will become part of Sue Rothmeyer's responsibilities. <laughs> How quickly they stop working. So, just to be clear, this is a, a the motion from the refer, from the reference and council committee is to refer this provision to the office of the secretary. Uh, doing that means that well, it will fall into her desk. Um, but then also, it won't be. It, if you do that, it won't be adopted at this at this assembly. So, is there any uh, discussion on the motion to refer? Qu microphone three. Matthew Brockmeyer, Greater Milwaukee Synod. Uh, this is part of the same series of motions having to do with powerless or oppressed. In that, the. Uh, the action taken on the previous item, 402C, would take effect after the 22, 2022 churchwide assembly, if adopted. Uh, I see referral to the church council as appropriate for this in subsequent motions uh, so that all of these could come into effect together. Could you just, are you making a motion? No. Oh, thank goodness. Because no, he made I, a I'm, speech. I no, mean, I'm, no, that he made a speech. I don't want you ruling out of order. No, I'm, I'm speaking to uh, the recommendation to refer. Thank you. And in support of it, in that then all of these could coincide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any Bishop? more speaking to Bishop? the motion to refer? Bishop. Hold on. Oh, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> How soon we forget. For purposes of clarity going on, 73102A8, 76102C, S1412A8, S1432C, C903A8, and C923C are the same issue repeated. I would suggest, in fact, since there, is there a motion on the floor? There's a motion to refer. There's a motion to refer. That's then it. I'm out of order. <laughs> you know, and this is probably a man who does not cheat at solitaire, nor does he fool around with his golf scores. That is impressive. Thank you very much. So we still have a motion to refer on the floor. Are you speaking to the motion? Microphone one. Yes. James Allgaard, Grace Lutheran Church, Wenatchee, Washington. Uh, I'm in favor of the motion to refer, especially if um, the committee, in fact, made the motion or if they recommended the motion. They, they made it. They made the, mo they made the motion. Okay. Uh, and I'm in favor of referral of this and like items as the secretary um, made mention because um, this provision would effectively change the letter of call for every rostered minister of word and sacrament currently serving the ELCA and I have a sense that due consideration due process has not um, come to pass really for the entire roster to um, embrace this thank you Speaking to the motion to refer, microphone six. 
Aaron Klassen, Metropolitan Chicago Synod. I stand to speak against this motion to refer so that the assembly might have the opportunity to bring a motion to bring all of these provisions which Secretary Berger just shared with us into compliance with each other. Thank you. Microphone one. I'm not sure of the order, but can I make an amendment to this amendment? Yes, yes, you may. Okay, this is Jerry Key, Reformation. I would like to, uh, uh, Reformation Lutheran, I would like to make the amendment that the other numbers given to, for, by the secretary that affects this uh, particular uh, motion be all in, tangled together so that in 2020 they will all show up together. That's my motion. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, we have a point of order here in a minute, but could you, folks, when you're making amendments, could you please bring them to us so we can make sure we have them on the screen? Point of order, microphone 11. Uh, Kurt Item, Northwest Washington Synod. I'm asking for a postponement of 10 minutes to, on this, uh, of this uh, referendum. May, may I speak to why I asked please. that? Please. Oh, you have I, to, I think you have to move to postpone. So we'd be, you Oh gosh, where's the parliamentarian? He's, Okay, you would be, before you speak to it, you'd be moving to change the order of the day for a 10, for, for 10 minutes pause on consideration of the, the matter before us. That's correct. Okay, is there a second? Please second. Well, I need to hear it. Oh, there, very good. Now you may speak. And the reason I'm asking for this is to clear the floor to allow Bishop Berger's I'm not, excuse me, he was my bishop, uh, Secretary Berger's motion to get it on the floor to clean it up. That's the reason for the postponement. So, so you want to make... I can't make that as a part of the motion. But you're right. unclear about what, we're, about what we are voting. What I'm saying is we postpone it that, clear, that opens the floor no. and it allows... Does it not? Doesn't? Nope. I thought it did. Chris, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, there's a, a motion on the floor to change the rules of order to delay conversation about this for 10 minutes. It's been moved and seconded. If you're in favor of postponing, press one. If you don't approve, press two. Please vote now. Okay, we'll check on that. Thank you. Uh, voting is closed. Let's see the results. The motion to postpone is defeated. And now we need to clear up um, just what we're voting about. Okay. Please, microphone seven. Andreas Teich, Messiah Lutheran Church, Bay City, uh, Northwest Lower Michigan Synod. I got my name right. Um, I think motion J includes all of the items that Secretary Berger mentioned. And if motion J is what is on the floor, then we have covered the question from the gentleman from Milwaukee. Thank you, though he did make an amendment and it was seconded. Uh, another point of order, microphone, why don't you hop over to two there. Thank you. Go ahead. Brian Benbos, Northeast Ohio Synod. I'm just confused. I don't understand what we may or may not be voting on in terms of the recommendation of the motion to refer. Would that be uh, that this constitutional provision will come back to us at the next churchwide assembly in align with the other corresponding provisions? Or is that we're giving authority somehow to the Office of Secretary to make determination? I don't know if he heard any of those questions because I was asking him a question. 
Actually, to the question, motion to refer back to the Office of the Secretary means that this would be in the queue for presentation in 2022. The only group that can amend the Constitution is this assembly. The Secretary, can, the Secretary with the presiding bishop can recommend to the Church Council who recommends to you. Right. Yeah, uh, uh, microphone one, if you could um, restate your amendment again, you. and we'll make sure that we all know what we're talking about here, what we're voting on, please. Okay, my amendment is um, if the Secretary could list all of the associated um, provisions. provisions that relates to the original amendment, we could tie those all together and put them in as one vote. Bishop, if you look in your guidebook under the reports of the Reference and Council Committee, you'll see Motion J, which is exactly what they have done. So, here's the thing, um, as the Secretary has rightly pointed out, uh, what, what the, uh, the voting member is requesting um, that's already been done in J, which we have passed. No. No, no we've not. It's concluded in. Please tell me what I'm doing. Referson Council came up and introduced this and suggested that they wanted to refer to the Office of the Secretary. That's resolution or motion J under the Reference and Council report. It includes all of the things that I mentioned already in that. The response would be to refer that to the Secretary for presentation in 2022. Okay, so when we get to the point, when we vote on that motion, uh, that includes J, which would, would include all of the things that the uh, uh, voting member um, was included in his amendment. So Point of clarification. And where are you? Okay, microphone one, please. Carl Richards, Southeastern Pennsylvania Synod. Would it be cleaner to have our previous person, if they were willing, to move to substitute motion J for the motion on the floor. I don't think so. So we've got an amendment on the floor. Yes, mm -hmm. but rather than the amendment that he's making, if he moved to amend by substituting motion J for what's on the floor, would that fit? He can't do that. Okay. Microphone seven. Andreas Teich, Messiah Lutheran Bay City. Motion J is on the floor. Yeah. Right. Uh, one horse, no it's not. Motion J is on the floor. We understand that, but there's an amendment also on the floor that we have to deal with as we're trying to work through. They're redundant. Point of clarity again. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute, please. We'll get, we'll get right there, sir. Okay. Thank you. So the ruling of the chair is that the amendment that's before us is out of order because it's redundant and will be covered under J, which is up for that's that's up for that's on the floor. Does anybody want to challenge the ruling of the chair? Yes. Thank you. Yes, I do. Yes, sir. The reason I gave the amendment is because the secretary gave us a list of things that would be affected by the original amendment. Yes, sir. So I tried to use those numbers, and now you tell me that was already somewhere else. If Why were we voting on the first amendment if that was there? Mr. Secretary. So we should be voting on the first amendment if those other things are already covered. So you, that was, shouldn't have been brought up on the, on, the, on the topic. So I will remove my amendment if we're going back to the original amendment. Mr. Secretary? The Reference and Council Committee moved motion J. The Assembly was focused only on one part of that. I said what these other things were there to bring that to your attention. They are part of motion J. Your amendment is asking to put things into the motion, into the motion that are already there. So everything that I described was already there in motion J. We just got distracted with only one part of it and didn't recognize the others were there. That's why I was pointing it out. Okay, but the original discussion was for that one that was separated. So if there was nothing else that was going to be affected by that is why we're here now, because you added those other things to that amendment. 
Now, what we have now, though, is... Um, uh, uh, we have so a, my amendment, I will take back, and we can go back to the original amendment. Well, okay. The ruling of the chair is that I'll allow you to take back your amendment. Thank you. Is there any... Does anyone want to, want to challenge the ruling of the chair? No, fine. Then we're back. Thank you very much, sir. Reverend Chair. Wait, wait, where are you? I'm at Resource Mike. Oh, sorry. Yes, please. Clarence Smith from Church Council, speaking as a resource person and as a member of the Reverence and Council Committee. Look. <laughs> we have matters coming before us. One came from Constitutional um, Committee of the Church Council. That's why Secretary Berger is standing before us. The same um, arguments came by virtue of reference and counsel for maker Mr. Brockmeyer from the Greater Milwaukee Senate. That's why these two items are meshed together. Um, as stated, the reference and counsel committee, calling this motion J, our decision was to refer this to the office of the secretary. Instead, Mr. Brockmeyer has decided to challenge that decision by reference and counsel and put this on the floor of the assembly. I think what Mr. Brockmeyer is trying to do is get parallel language in several provisions of the CBCR, the Constitution, Bylaws, and Continuing Resolutions. So I applaud his efforts for doing that, but it's very confusing. Any case, where, however we vote, these won't take action and won't be implemented until 2022. Thank you. Microphone 12. Joshua Copeland, North Carolina Synod. I move to end debate and call the previous question. Is there a second? Thank you. Are you ready to vote? To close debate, press 1. To continue debate, press 2. Please press, please vote now. Voting is closed. May we see the results? We voted to close debate. Now we have the, where did it go? There it is. This is, could you restate what's before us, please, Secretary? Motion, motion J of reference and counsel. Okay. Are you clear? Motion J. Reference and Council, this is before you. Uh, to vote in favor of the motion for Reference and Council, please press 1. Those opposed, press 2. Please vote now. Voting is closed. May we see the results? Motion J is adopted. Thank you. We have five minutes before the orders of the day. Can we bring up another one? The next amendment to be that has been pulled from on block is 74103. There was not an amendment proposed to reference in council. This just was removal from on block. There's no a recommendation for, from reference and counsel. Is there any discussion about this uh, motion mo removed from on block? Microphone seven. Ryan Anderson from the Central Southern Illinois Synod. I requested this proposed amendment be removed <coughs> from on block after conversations with colleagues, some of whom serve in non-congregational calls. My concern is the intent of the amendment especially regarding the phrase, continued only as warranted for the ministry needs of this church. I do not want this phrase too narrowly interpreted, especially in areas of the ELCA feeling the anxiety of scarcity with increasing numbers of open calls and fewer pastors to fill them. I do not propose any changes to the proposed amendment at this time because the language codifies current practice. I trust the discernment of synod councils. 
The language of the original 74103 offers ample guidance for this discernment, and I don't wish to make our governing documents even that much longer. However, I will at this time like to speak in support of the witness and service given by pastors in non-congregational calls. Yes, confessionally and constitutionally, we are rooted in Christ as church in three expressions. Yet, it is the purpose of roots to produce branches and bear fruit. Persons serving in non-congregational calls with an identifiable relationship to word and sacrament ministry embody the ELCA's presence in the world. Moreover, and furthermore, they are living and active reminders that when we, each and all, are called to be church for the sake of the world, we are required to be, as it were, out and about to fulfill the mission needs of this church. Ultimately, the amendment so pro as proposed does not discount any of this. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone 11. Has there been a movement on the floor? Who are you, please? Kristen Claudie, uh, Northern Texas, Northern Louisiana Thank pastor. You. Um, I would like to move to replace this language with language that I submitted to the council. And hopefully they have it. Reference in council does not have it. Or do we have it? Hi, Kristen. Uh, when you submitted it, it was past the deadline. Okay. So we might have it electronically, uh, but our, our committee does not have it. And so we could not make a recommendation. Okay. okay. Um, I would like to uh, speak against this uh, uh, amendment. <laughs> um, I'm a pastor and a chaplain in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, I also supply preach and I uh, help with a local pub church um, in unconventional places. And um, word and sacrament ministry is really important to me in these places. Um, the language in the proposed amendment is demeaning to those who serve in this specialized ministry and self-serving of the ELCA as a whole. We say we are a church for the sake of the world. Chaplains and other pastors in non-congregational calls are doing this work, work that is deeply missional, sharing word and sacraments in ecumenical interfaith and hospitals, prisons, camps, schools, war zones, to name a few, meeting people where they are. Ministers who do this work should not be treated as suspect or assumed to be self-serving any more so than ministers in congregational calls. These non-congregational calls should be celebrated. Furthermore, chaplains and other Others should not have to fear that their call could be revoked yearly at the decision of their bishop, synod council, or church council when a new bishop or council is elected or when they change their mind about whether their call is pastoral or sacramental enough. Um, there are already significant barriers to be getting a call that is non-congregational. And so if they, are, if they do that, Thank they should have to be much. reviewed annually. Thank you. Is there any more speaking to this, to 7.41.03? Seeing none, are you ready to vote? I'm sorry, microphone five. I would like to, um, sorry, Pastor Kyle Severson, Metro Chicago Senate. I would like to move the language. What, 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 what? Amend this. Amendments had to be submitted by the deadline. Gotcha, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, so now I think we're ready to vote. Those in favor? of adopting 7.41.03 press one. Those opposed, point of order, microphone six. Ivan Perez, Metro Chicago Senate. I move to suspend the rules so we can do what the previous gentleman wanted to do. <laughs> Because there's a motion on the floor, you would have to move to suspend the rules of procedure, which say once there's a motion on the floor, you can't move to suspend. And that would have require a second and a two-thirds vote. And then we'd be suspending the rules. And then there'd be a sub subsequent motion when you could offer your other motion to suspend. Yeah. 
So we're voting now whether or not we are willing to suspend Point the rule. Point of order. Where are you? Ten. Oh, thank you. Please, microphone ten. Pastor Laura Camprath, Northern Illinois Synod. Um, the secretary just replied to, I think, Pastor Severson, if I have his name correctly. Mm -hmm. His He wanted to make an amendment and he said, well, we missed the deadline, but we just amended several other constitutional provisions. We changed equality to equity. We made several other amendments, so I don't understand that. Those amendments had been received by reference in council before the deadline. The change from equality to equity had been received? That came from the floor. Oh, boy. It should have been out of order. I shouldn't have voted. Hold on. <laughs> You're quite correct. Six more years. <laughs> Thank you. So we, you're proposing a, uh, uh, to suspend the rules of organization and procedure for the assembly. That's correct. Is there a second? Second. You may speak to your motion. I move to suspend the rules so that we can take into account the language that should have been on the floor um, should our previous speaker move it. Is there any further speaking to the motion to suspend the rules? Microphone 12. Dennis Lane, Southwestern Pennsylvania Senate. I call the orders of the day. Thank you. That's in order. We need to move on with the orders of the day. We'll consider our con considerate, we'll continue our consideration of resolutions in tomorrow's plenary sessions. Um, just to understand uh, what, what, this, what this means, what the implications are, these coming from uh, reference and counsel, these are provisions that can only be passed by the churchwide assembly. We'll see what we can do to make sure that those come back, but the orders of the day have been called. Thank you. We return now to the report of the Memorials Committee, and we call on co-chairs Cheryl Chapman and Reed Christofferson as they have an update that may help the assembly in its work on C1, church and state, D1, 50th anniversary amended made motion now to be considered since the social statement was adopted this morning. C3, migrants. A6, poor people's campaign. C5, call to edit sexuality social statement. D7, health care benefits. Did you miss us? So if you could return to the microphones where you were when we, when we uh, ended debate on this. So we are now considering... We're on C1. Church and State. Okay, is there any speaking to microphone nine? I have a motion, a substitute motion. Go ahead. Uh, to receive with gratitude the memorial from the Minneapolis Area Synod, requesting a social statement on the role of government, the nature of civic engagement, and the relationship of church and state, and to authorize the development of an ELCA social statement on government, civic engagement, and the relationship of church and state that will allow thorough attention to scriptural historical, theological, and social issues as a means to probe shared convictions and establish this church's comprehensive teaching in accordance with the policies and procedures of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America for addressing social concerns 
2018, and to urgently request the ELCA Church Council to authorize a social message as a priority in the development of a social statement. This message would elaborate in one place what this church already holds regarding issues such as public church, the vocation of citizenship, the relation of church and state in accordance with policies and procedures of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America for addressing social concerns 2018. Thank you. Is there a second? You may speak to your motion to amend. The siblings in Christ, we submitted this motion in response to many personal pleas from churchwide assembly members who need this shared understanding to help members in their congregations grapple with and understand how and why we as Lutherans have a call to interact, advocate to, and hold responsible our government. It recognizes both this urgent need and the need for a deep conversation as we seek peace and equity and justice in our world. In addition, we have created somewhat of a, of a false choice on the floor. If the Spirit moves this assembly to, to authorize one, two, or seven social statements, the Spirit will provide the church with the resources to answer the, this call. Thank you. Microphone 11. Laura Zeal, Pacifica Senate, speaking in favor of the motion to amend by substitution. I have heard the urgency of now at these microphones from my siblings in Christ, as well as in this assembly, to address the critical matters of church and state in a timely manner, with which I wholeheartedly agree. And yet I also yearn for the gravity and weight of a social statement on these matters to guide and inform the churchwide expression as well as the synodical and congregational expressions of our church. The substitute motion is intended to include both the urgency of now and the powerful weight of a social statement in these important matters, both and being a significant way to operate as Lutheran people. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone five. Clyde Walter, Metropolitan Chicago Synod, he, him, his. Uh, I rise uh, to speak once again in favor. I will keep this brief as it is mainly to affirm the two speakers before me, the Memorials Committee, which I was on, uh, we have heard many in this assembly feel both a need for an urgent, timely social message, but also an interest to take the time and the resources to invest in a social statement. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone seven. My name is Peter Metcalf, Montana Synod. I also rise in favor of this amendment. I appreciate the clarity provided by the previous speakers around the uh, false dichotomy of only being able to do one social statement. I think it's urgent that we tackle this problem in a day when we have so much cacophonic voices out there regarding the role of religion in the public sphere, um, the role of Christian nationalism, the role of advocacy from religious perspectives, and we need to have a clear voice and message of what this church uh, believes is relevant and up to date um, for our time and place and not simply rely on statements that have already been created some decades ago. I think this will be a useful uh, both to create the social statement and the message, and I urge us to pass this amendment. Thank you. That's four uh, speakers in favor. I see none opposed, so the debate is closed. We're now ready to vote on this memorial. Amendment. Amendment. I'm most awfully sorry. By substitution. So, if you're, you remember what this is? Okay. So we're voting uh, in if you're in favor of the motion to amend by substitution, press 1. If you're opposed, press 2. Please vote now. <laughs> Voting is closed. May we see the results? The substitute motion is adopted. Yes. Thank you. So we voted to substitute, and that substituted motion is now what's before us for conversation and discussion. Okay. Anyone speaking to that? Oh, point of order. Hold on. Where are you? Uh, microphone one. I call the question. Spencer Legrig, uh, St. Paul Synod. That's not a point of order. Okay. But you're first in line, so microphone one. Spencer Leggard, St. Paul Synod. Call the question. Is there a second? All right, I think. Point of order. There's no one lined up anyway, so. 
Microphone 11. Reverend Chair, good to see you again. <laughs> one cannot call the point, one cannot call the question unless there's been at least one vote in the negative on the motion just made. The substitute now requires debate at least one speaker in the negative to it. Oh, Matthew, I'm so sorry. I appreciate that. Thank you. If there is, in fact, yes, there is. Microphone 12. I promise he didn't put me up to this. Uh, Courtney Peeler, Nebraska Synod. We have an election coming up before the 2022 churchwide assembly. And I would like to speak opposed to the idea of creating the social statement on government, civic engagement, and the relationship with the church, and ask that we change that into a social message. The reason I'm voting against it is because I want a message and not a statement, because I want response faster, quicker, before November of 2020. May, may I? Yes, uh, thank please. You. So the, the, the substitute motion before us is that a social statement be developed, but in preparation to develop that, a social message be worked on immediately. Yes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're very welcome. Is there any more? Call the question. Thank you. Is there a second? Okay, now we're going to vote whether or not to um, end debate. If you're, about, if you're in favor of ending debate, press 1. If you're opposed, press 2. Please vote now. Voting is closed. May we see the results? Okay, we're done debating. We're voting on the motion as it before you with the substitute motion. You clear? We're voting on the whole enchilada. <laughs> Those in favor, please press one. Those opposed, press two. Please vote now. Voting is closed. May we see the results? It has been adopted. Thank you very much. Continue. And thanks for the chocolate. That was awfully kind. <laughs> Bishop Eaton, the Memorials Committee requests return to Memorials D1 regarding the 50th anniversary of the ordination of women, which was previously deferred, waiting for the adoption of faith, faith sexism, and justice. Point of order. Microphone 11. Hi, Anna Zarnick Niemeyer, Northwest Washington Synod. I move to table Memorial C5 to a time uncertain. And I need a second, I believe. That's out of order because there's something before us now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So that's before us. It's been seconded, so we're ready for discussion now. Any discussion on D.1? Seeing none, are you ready to vote? If you're in favor, please press 1. Opposed, press 2. Please vote now. Voting is closed. May we see the results? The memorial is adopted. Thank you very much. Ms. Chapman. Okay. We're now ready for assembly action on C. Wait, wait, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, point of microphone order. 11. Anna Zarnick, Niemeyer, Northwest Washington Synod. Is pronouns. this a point of order? Yes. Go right ahead. Anna Zarnick, Niemeyer, Northwest Washington Synod, pronouns she, her, hers. I move to table Memorial C5 to a time uncertain. That's not a point of order. It's a motion motion. Can I ask a question? You may ask a question. Um, we would like to table our <laughs> memorial. How do I do that? <laughs> when we get to it, you can table it, if it's the will of the assembly. We need to wait until we get to that memorial. Yes. OK, thank you, madam. You're very welcome. OK, if we can now. We call them madam. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
good. She's a chair. Okay, please, Ms. Chapman. Yes, if we can now give our attention to category C3, migrants, page, uh, found on page 46. To receive with gratitude the memorial from the Delaware, Maryland Senate concerning migrants and refugees. To reaffirm the long-term and growing commitment of this church to migrants and refugees and to the policy questions involved as exemplified most recently in the comprehensive strategy accompanying migrant minors with protection, advocacy, representation, and opportunities. To encourage members of this church to review existing social teaching and policy and use these guides to take additional action toward addressing harmful political rhetoric against migrants and refugees. And to request that appropriate staff in the domestic vision, global mission, and mission advancement units develop a plan for additional tools that provide for education and discernment specifically directed to the political rhetoric and the accurate portrayal of migrants and refugees. I so move. Thank you. This comes before you from a committee, so there's no, it already is seconded. It's before you for discussion. We're at Memorial C3. Microphone 12. Mark Parker, Delaware, Maryland Senate, 8F. <laughs> Rising to uh, amends by addition. Go ahead. Um, to add, uh, after the fourth clause, to add further, quote, to authorize the development of an ELCA social statement on migrants and refugees in accordance with the policies and procedures of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America for addressing social concerns, 2018. Is there a second? You may speak to your amendment. I think we all understand that, um, that the welcome and the support of migrants and refugees is critical and is central to our mission and our public witness as a church. It has been for generations. It continues to be even more important now. We have been not simply a passive participant, but a leader in the welcome of migrants and refugees. And so this is a critical issue for us. It's a critical issue for our neighbors, not just based on recent news reports, um, but any of our experience of the past few decades understands um, that the movement of peoples through migration and its refugee status um, draws people into all kinds of vulnerability, oppression, and puts them at play um, to be hurt um, by our legal systems and by the other systems of government around the world. We have our social message. We have our Amparo, uh, our LRS work, Border Servant Corps, and other partnerships. We have many excellent statements of synods and leaders. We are being responsive as a church, and yet there is one missing piece as I see it. A social statement is, to me, uh, the one missing piece, the concerted theological and educational effort of the breadth and depth of our church to support and sustain and shape our advocacy and our action, not simply now, but in the generation to come. We need to mobilize all of the resources of our church towards addressing this grave concern in our society. A social statement on migrants and refugees is necessary for two reasons. One, we need the final product. This isn't about responding to current political issues or current elections or current policies. It's about recognizing that the landscape of migration and refugees is changing rapidly underfoot. From rising uh, nationalism, ethnic-based nationalism, to the movement of peoples because of economic inequality and because of climate change, the need for a long-term um, grounded approach to guide the next generation of our action on this is important. Finally, we need the process. We need to make sure that our congregations are engaging in deep conversation, reflection, prayer, and thoughtfulness so this isn't just a, uh, an issue carried forward by a few churches, but by all of us. Thank you. I'd like to call on Treasurer Lori Fedick to, to speak to the financial implications of this. So you want me to speak to the financial implication of another social statement? Yes. Okay. Just so everyone's aware. So we have one social statement in the budget. Social statements um, run approximately $100,000 per year. And what we heard yesterday was a social statement takes five years. Thank you. Further Is there further speaking to the amendment? Megaphone 12. 
Pastor Hans Becklin, member of the ELCA Church Council. Reverend Chair, I rise in opposition to this amendment as I consider the nature of citizenship and migration to be a locus to be considered under the already approved social statement on government and the nature of the state. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone three. Courtney Smith, Southeast Pennsylvania Synod. Um, I served as a Yagam in South Africa two years ago, and while I was there, I had the ability to attend a workshop with representatives from different African countries who were first responders to refugees and to migrants and to all of the people that we are talking about um, in you know, looking for this social statement. And they were all just as scared as the United States is. And so if we could step forward and come up with this social statement, we're gonna say something to the world because everyone in that room looked to me as the person from America to have all the answers and to calm their fear. And I couldn't do that. And so I think that if we could make a social statement, this is gonna say a lot to our partners around the world. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear from the resource mic again, uh, Treasurer Fedick. So a point of clarification, um, the social statements do typically take five years for a total cost of 300000 so it would be about $67,000 a year. However, because we only have one staff person to work in this area, it is likely that we would have to add, add additional staff resources, which would take the total up, so probably would be closer to the 500000 Thank you. Microphone 10. Are you, is this, is this a point of order? No, it's Okay, a... microphone 10. 10. There you are. May Jean Zelly, Pastor May Jean Zelly, um, South Central Synod of Wisconsin. I speak in opposition to this amendment and not by any means because I am not in favor of us being bold in our support of uh, refugees and immigrants and all of the things, but I think that we are in danger of falling into a trap to think that because we're making a social statement about something that we're doing something about something. No, I think no, no. we need to be about the business of getting out of our chairs and into the streets and, and, and in the offices of our representatives instead of um, making another long study that will take a long time. I do understand the desire for the depth of engagement that this amendment reflects, but I think that uh, at present we already, unlike um, the biblical issues surrounding uh, sexism in the Bible, I do not think we have any lack of clarity on how we should welcome this stranger. Thank you. Microphone three. Tom Salver, Southeastern Pennsylvania. I, I speak in favor. I am in a congregation presently where we did refugee resettlement. That was part of our mission and ministry, which we are unable to do now. But because of what we did, and we keep saying the church, uh, many of those individuals have now joined my congregation. They are part of this church, and I think we need to be a voice for those. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone two. Brian Pembos, Northeastern Ohio Synod. Uh, I stand in opposition against the amendment calling for a social statement, not in any way because I do not believe this is the most important issue. It is, of course, or that the church should take action, but I think that it's important that this body know that we already have a social message on immigration uh, adopted in 1998 that applies to this issue. Uh, and I call into the question the need to take further time and resources of the church simply to enhance that and uh, broaden that into a social statement. Thank you, microphone nine. Pastor Susan Halver, Alaska Synod, she, her, hers pronouns. We've, I speak in favor of this amendment because I think it's very important that we address and provide resources for the depth of this issue. We have said very little at this churchwide assembly about climate change. There was an article in the New York Times two days ago that speaks to what we can expect in terms of migration in the coming years, and particularly concerns about food insecurity. It, the report was prepared by 100 experts from 52 countries. They said that a half billion people already live in places turning into de desert. Soil is being lost between 10 and 100 times faster than it is farming. Climate change will make things worse. Already, more than 10% of the world's population remains undernourished, and food shortages could lead to an increase in cross-border migration. 
A particular danger is that food crises could develop on several continents at once. This is a concern that we need to address. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone 11. Christina Nelson, Southwest Minnesota Synod. Um, I have a question that I fear might muddy the waters, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Please do. Okay. Um, what would be the difference between a social statement and a policy statement, such as the policy statement we just passed at this assembly regarding interfaith relationships? Pastor Willer. <laughs> I'm not sure I've ever had such a big class to educate on these things. There are three kinds of social uh, teaching and policy documents in our church. One is the social statements, we've talked about those. The second is the social message, which are dependent upon our statements and are adopted by church council because in line with our social statements. Social policy resolutions are the kinds of things that we do as a church that are they're focused and they're directive. So there is a social message on immigration adopted in 1998, and then there was a need to address focused concern on immigration and five um, resolutions after uh, were adopted in that uh, document in 2008. Is that sufficient? Thank you. Does that help? Um, a little bit. So essentially, there's basically a policy statement, just yes. not officially? Pastor Willer? Social policy resolutions are official statements of our church. There's, there's official social policy resolutions. They indicate where our church stands on a particular issue. Let me use um, a quick example. Uh, we, as a church, uh, in churchwide assembly adopted a social policy resolution that put this church on record for um, the uh, Dreamers Act. Um, I may not have the right language there, but you, so that's a social policy resolution, very focused, particular sort of thing. And on that basis then, um, our advocacy people and our bishops and other public leaders of our church can speak into the public square saying this church believes that we ought to do X, Y, Z. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, resource microphone, Reverend Dr. Rivetta Bullock. I guess just a point of information, the ELCA social message on migration was reviewed and updated in 2018 as part of our ministry around Amparo. Thank you. Microphone 12. Joshua Copeland, North Carolina Synod. I move to end debate and call the previous question. Is the debate is about the, the amendment? Yes. Yes. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Get ready to vote. All those in favor of ending debate, a debate on, the, on this amendment, press one. Those opposed, press two. Please vote now. Voting is closed. May we see the results? Debate is closed. We will now move to voting on the amendment. And do you remember what the amendment is? It's to develop a social statement. Okay. Are we clear? Is any, are you ready? Okay. All those in favor of the amendment, press 1. Those opposed, press 2. Please vote now. Voting is closed. May we see the results? The amendment fails. So we have before us again C3. Is there any further discussion on uh, this memorial? No. There. 
So this is uh, category C1. It's a, there's, it's a recommended action to receive with gratitude, et cetera, and to request the appropriate staff, et cetera. Are you, for those of you who are visually impaired, are you able to figure out where we are? Are we clear? Thank you, thank you, Craig. Uh, I'm B uh, Bishop Satterley. Um, let's all, if you're ready to vote, which we are, um, if you're in favor, vote. Press one. If you're opposed, press two. Please vote now. Voting is closed. May we see the results? The memorial is adopted. Thank you. We now bring before you uh, Memorial A6, the Poor People's Campaign, found on page 21 of your guidebook, to receive with gratitude the memorials from the Oregon, New England, and Metropolitan New York Synods concerning the National Poor People's Campaign, and to affirm the Church Council action recognizing the importance of the Poor People's Campaign in bringing an end to systemic racism, economic injustice, ecological devastation, and related injustices, to support the vision and goals of the Poor People's Campaign that are in alignment with this Church's social teachings, to encourage the churchwide organization, synods, congregations, and members become involved with the issues as a faithful witness to God's call to do justice and to show love for the neighbor. We move this action. Thank you. Is there any speaking to this? Microphone five. Mark Erson, Metro New York Synod, he, him, his pronouns. I wish to offer an amendment. Please do. Continuing at the, at, the, um, at the end of the text, and for the ELCA to endorse the Poor People's Campaign. Is there a second? Second. You may speak to your amendment. Okay. Um, thank you. Some uh, words from the Poor People's Campaign website. A national call for moral revival is uniting people across the country to challenge the evils of systemic racism, poverty, the war economy, ecological devastation, and the nation's distorted, moral, distorted morality. I also offer you a, a list of some of the endorsing organizations. Disciples of Christ, Episcopal Church USA, Islamic Society of North America, Jewish Voice for Peace, Jews for Radical and Economic Justice, Muslim Peace Fellowship, National Council of Churches, Presbyterian Church USA, Progressive National Baptist Convention, Reconstructionist Rabbinical Association, Union of Reformed Ju Judaism, UCC, United Methodist Church. If you will notice, there are some of our full communion partners, as well as organizations that were on this very stage yesterday. I am sad to say that a faith-based organization that I am a passionate member of is missing from this list, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Throughout these days in assembly, we have listened to, we have been speaking, we have been singing, we have been praying, we have been applauding, we have been endorsing words that are inspiring and directing us to take actions long overdue though they may be, such as endorsing the Poor People's Campaign. Taking this step will give us the opportunity to build those interreligious relationships we have dedicated ourselves to. It will provide us a new opportunity to stand with those we have committed ourselves to working with and for. It will turn up the volume of our public witness to the gospel that we claim as our hope and the hope of the world. Yes, we are the church for the sake of the world. If so, let us join our unique voice to endorse the last ministry effort Thank of you. Dr. Martin Luther King. Microphone seven. I speak in favor of the motion, uh, Jennifer Crean, Southwest California Synod. The motion to amend. Yes, the motion Go to ahead. amend. Um, I wish to affirm what uh, the bishop just said, and I thank you for what he shared. Um, we have taken a lot of very, um, for me, heartening action this week, um, recognizing uh, our complicity 
as particularly as white people within this denomination on issues of racism uh, and also on the intersectionality that comes uh, with race, economic status, gender, sexual orientation, and more. Uh, I, I would like us to see, I would like to see us do more than just say the right things. I would like for us to take action, and I think that this amendment is one of the ways that we can take action. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for the, with Pastor Willer would come to the, 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 the resource mic and explain what, it, what, what the technical meaning of, of endorsement is. The technical meaning of endorsement uh, in this particular case, according to the folks who are the leaders of the uh, Poor People's Campaign, is really a kind of all or nothing. Um, endorsement, as they have, and we ha have had conversations with them, and they, uh, there's a program, there's a vision which was read, but there's also a set of principles and a set of demands which are very specific. And endorsement would mean that this church endorses the entire package of what is there, not just the vision. And that's where the um, concern has been. Thank you. Microphone six. Uh, Joe Nolte, uh, Church Council, Memorials Committee, and uh, South Houston Iowa Synod. So um, we had a really robust conversation around this in the Memorials Committee. And uh, what led us to the original wording and why we did not include an endorsement, as the motion is suggesting, is because there are a number of issues that the Poor People's Campaign demands that we either do not have the policy to support or that the ELCA is not discerned or settled upon. You'll find a listing of those, a partial listing, in the background materials to the recommended motion. Um, because of that, and again, the fundamental uh, question here is whether this is something that uh, it, it's not whether we agree individually with the ideas of the Poor People's Campaign. Endorsement means we're all in and our church is all in, but our church has not actually said that we're all in with all of these things in our policy documents. So I would encourage you to vote against this amendment. Thank you. Microphone five. Reverend Kwame Pitts, Metropolitan Chicago Senate and resident troublemaker in this church. I hope my new Senate, Upper State New York Senate, realizes what you're inheriting from Metro Chicago Senate. I, dear church, I speak on behalf of my sibling, the Reverend Lenny Duncan, and many of us in this church who are dedicated to continuing doing the work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who, it seems, people love to venerate him now that his voice is silent, that his physical presence is no longer a threat, because let us be clear, Dr. King was doing the work that the Risen One calls us to into, to do justice. Jesus was countercultural, bucking against the empire and religious leaders who were not in favor of elevation and liberation of all people. When I'm in the midst of the words of institution, I tell my congregation, now that you have been fed with the body and blood, go do something. Dear church, we have been committed to so much this week we have stated to the wider breadth of society what we are about. This is how we mirror Jesus' teachings and commandments. They are action items. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone 8. Peter Metcalf, Montana Synod, and it is with a heavy heart that I rise to oppose this amendment. I believe that the Poor People's Campaign is much needed in this country, and I appreciate its leadership in bringing these attention uh, to our public sphere and support much of what it's about. However, I'm concerned that as a church body, we have not adequately had the time or the space to deliberate the actual policy recommendations that it's requiring us to endorse, and that many of the policy recommendations may not, in fact, get us to the place we would like them to get us to. Therefore, I think it would be premature for us to endorse en banc all of the policy recommendations in the Poor People's Campaign, and that we need to simply uh, defeat this amendment and affirm the campaign and encourage continued engagement with it, but to allow that space for sufficient public deliberation around these policy recommendations. Therefore, I encourage us to defeat this amendment and re retain the original language. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone three. Hi. Mart Arfston, she, hers, young adult member from Metro New York. 
I believe so fully in the all-encompassing love that we know through Christ and the incredible and radical welcome of message of love and welcome that the ELCA supports in its theology. Joining m many other mainline Protestant denominations by endorsing the Poor People's Campaign is a firm action that we can take as the church that every report at this assembly this far has said we are trying to be. As the ELCA, we do, do we do so many great things because we're a truly great church that has shown in all that we are celebrating here that we want to grow and learn and be intentional in showing our love toward others. But we need to break out of the safety of our church buildings and our meetings and put our po actions where our polity is. How can we be church for the sake of the world if we aren't going out into the world to meet and work with the people who are there? Truly supporting and fully endorsing the Poor People's Campaign may feel scary because it isn't the self-contained environment of a campaign run by Lutherans for Lutheran ministries and affiliates. But at its essence, the Poor People's Campaign speaks to those most disenfranchised and oppressed in this country. And whether it is comfortable or not, that is exactly what we are called to do as Christians and what our policies in the ELCA encourage us to do. Because we are a great church with a great message, and we should not play it safe with our support of the Poor People's Campaign. Because there are very real, very alive people right now who need our help, and endorsing this campaign is a firm and real statement both to those in need and those in political power in this country that we are a church that takes action and is ready to do God's work with our hands. Thank you. Microphone 11. Bishop John Anderson, Southwestern Minnesota. I call the question of the amendment. Is there a second? Okay, voting means we'll close debate on the amendment. If you vote in favor, vote, the, the discussion will close. If, you vote, if you're opposed, then we'll continue. You clear? If you, vote, if you vote in favor of this, we'll end debate. If you vote against it, debate will continue. Okay, one for yes, two for no, please vote now. Voting is closed. Let's see the results. We have voted to end debate. The amendment is properly before us. Are we clear what the amendment is? We're going to add and for the ELCA to endorse the Poor, poor People's Campaign. Okay. If you're in favor of the amendment, you'll vote. Press 1. If you're opposed, press 2. Please vote now. Voting is closed. May we see the results? The amendment has failed. We now are back to the uh, memorial before us. Okay, that's A6. Are we clear? Is there any more discussion on A6? Seeing none, we're ready to vote. If you're in favor, press 1. If you're opposed, press 2. Please vote now. Oh, I know. Golly. Hmm. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. We have it. It's, it's not. We have it. It's up. Okay, here we go. If you're in favor, vote yes. Yeah, obviously. Vote Press 1. If you're opposed, press 2. Please vote now. It might still say sending on yours, but your votes are coming in.
Voting is closed. May we see the, may we see the results. It's been adopted. Try it now. We need the microphone at the podium. <laughs> okay. Good. Category C5, call to edit sexuality social statement, pages 49 to 50. Point yes. Mm -hmm. No, no. Yeah. Uh, uh. You finish well, saying this and we'll go right to you. Don't right. Go I was going to say, we know you had something you wanted to do, so go for it. I'm okay, go ahead, please. Job. Microphone 11. You're on. Thank you, and my apologies. We're all learning Robert's rules. Yes. <laughs> my name is Anna Zarnick Niemeyer from Northwest Washington Synod. I move to table this memorial to a time uncertain. Is there a second? You may speak to your motion. You might be wondering to yourselves, why would someone from the Synod that put forth this memorial and also someone from the LGBTQIA community be asking to table this memorial? And that's because there are more pressing issues at hand that deserve uh, enough adequate time to discuss and that the queer community in and of itself um, would like to see discussed. And that in particular is vision and expectations. This particular memorial was put forth in 2017 when it was a different time. It's asking for update of language, um, but we, we really would like to put to the floor as vision and expectations. Um, we trust that the church council would be able to handle this memorial. And again, I reiterate, I'm a member of both the LGBTQIA community and I consulted with others, and this is coming from my synod. So again, I would move to table this memorial to an uncert a time uncertain so that we have enough time to publicly discuss uh, important issues. This memorial came, did not come from someone from the LGBTQIA community, and so I'm telling you what we really want to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Is this a point of order? It, it's a question. question. It's a uh, question. So um, the, the question is if this is... Uh, Can you tell the, us who you are? Uh, Joe Nolte, pardon Thank me, um, uh, Church Council Memorials Committee, uh, South Eastern Iowa Senate. Um, not, I'm actually not, not in favor. It's a question. Uh, the question is if... Um, since the response to the memorial that's been proposed is to authorize a social statement editorial reconsideration, I'm only asking, can the church council actually authorize a revision of a social statement, or does that have to be approved by the churchwide assembly? Pastor Willer. Social statements are, let's use this word, creatures of churchwide assemblies. So they can only be revised, edited, etc., by the vote of a churchwide assembly. Thank you. Microphone 10. Point of information, um, and this is related to the um, Poor People's Campaign you, please, issue. I'm sorry, could you reintroduce yourself? Pastor May Jean Zelli, South Central Center, Wisconsin. Thank yeah. you. Um, to be clear, just because the third expression of the church, the churchwide assembly, did not endorse the Poor People's Campaign, that does not in any way preclude either congregations or synods from doing as much. Is that correct? Sure. I mean, that's not in order, but you're, you're, the answer is yes. We'll, okay. we'll allow it. Thanks. Now we're, we're speaking specifically on the motion to table to a time uncertain. Is there any more speaking to this motion? Microphone 11 has a question, point of order. Just a, a point of order, please. Uh, just to note that we have it in our provisions for this to move to 2022, uh, should that be required, which is why we moved to table it to a time uncertain. We understand that it needs to be at a, an assembly and it's within our... Let's get the answer for you, okay? Technically, the motion you are making is to postpone indefinitely which is to kill the motion. Anything laid on the table and not acted upon by this assembly dies at the end of the assembly. If you want to refer something to 2022, you need to refer it to some group that could bring it at that time. But this is essentially a motion to postpone indefinitely, which has the effect of killing the proposal. Are we clear then what happens if we, we, uh, we adopt the uh, motion to uh, table to a time uncertain, which is indefinitely, then if we don't get to it now, 
it'll come up, it, it, it's gone. So that's the motion before us. Microphone six. Uh, Cynthia Gustafson, member of the Church Council um, from Oklahoma, um, Arkansas Synod. Um, I think it's really important to know um, that trustworthy servants isn't going to end up um, being much different than it is unless we first look at the sexuality statement because our statement on sexuality is of a higher level. And so anything else is going to have to use the words that are used in the sexuality statement. So we need to look at that first. So you're or, speaking, or at the same time. You're speaking against the motion to table. Uh, yes, against it. Yes. Any further speaking? Okay. If you vote one, you're voting to table. Postpone, pardon me. Indefinitely. And if you vote two, you're saying we're not going to postpone indefinitely. Are you clear? Okay, please vote now. May we see the results? The motion to table has passed. Thank you. Next one. We are now going to move to Memorial D7 regarding health care benefits found on page 86. Uh, the recommended action to receive with gratitude the memorials from Lower Susquehanna and Delaware, Maryland synods concerning health care benefits for churchwide staff. To request the churchwide organization survey employees to understand the impact on staff and identify any modifications that can be made within budgeted funds for 2020. To encourage Portico to continue to provide educational tools to assist employees of the churchwide organization organization which thoroughly explain the different plans and to decline to restore the churchwide organization health care benefits to Portico Benefit Services Gold Plus plan at this time. We move this recommended action. Thank you. Microphone four. James Dunlop, Bishop of the Lower Susquehanna Synod, and I would like to move a substitute motion. Please do. And the text is available. I Thank submitted you. it. Resolved that the ELCA and Assembly direct the Church Council in partnership with the Conference of Bishops and Portico Benefit Services to review the current Church Council's recommendation for gold coverage for all rostered leaders and employees of the Church, and that they develop a recommendation for the whole Church for health insurance coverage by the spring meeting of the Church Council in 2020 for the 2021 enrollment, and further be resolved that the ELCA and Assembly direct the Office of the Bishop to restore the churchwide rostered leaders and employees the Gold Plus coverage for 2020, pay for the coverage of spouses and dependents who are not covered by other insurance, and that they continue to pay the waiver for any employee who receives coverage from another health insurance. Is there a second? You may speak to your motion. In November, the Church Council adopted a spending authorization that included three changes to the benefit of the churchwide employees. Gold Plus, which is an 80-20 plan, to a Silver Plus, which was a 70-30 plan, to pay a portion of spouse and dependent coverage, but not all, and to offer an incentive for employees to accept coverage outside the church. The Church Council in the past has recommended the standard health care for our church would be gold, and for coverage of dependents. The church-wide organization and the council ignored their own recommendation by this action. The secretary has reminded us that each expression of the church can do things independently, but clearly what the church-wide does influences the entire church. My synod and the Delaware-Maryland synod proposed rescinding this action in the memorials, 
The Memorial Committee is recommending taking no action on the coverage, but rather surveying the employees to see how they feel about their health care being reduced. I'm proposing a compromise that we ask the Synod, um, the Church Council, in partnership with the Conference of Bishops in Portico to review the recommendation for Gold Plus and either support this by completing this study in 2020 before the 2021 enrollment. This would be a mutual coordination across our ecosystem as the Vice President lifted up. And we would restore churchwide employees to Gold Plus and pay for dependents fully in 2020, which allows people to choose um, over the insurance that they have. Um, this allows churchwide to follow the current recommendation from the um, church council. This will cost a million dollars in 2020, and it allows um, for a continuation of a $500,000 savings. But the treasurers reported that they had a $3.8 million surplus and are running ahead this year. I don't think it'll break the bank. Thank you. I'd like to hear from the resource mic, uh, Treasurer Fedick. Thank you. As officers of this church, we have three responsibilities as it relates to the topic of health insurance coverage for the churchwide organization. Number one, to ensure that resources will be available to continue the mission of the ELCA for generations to come. Number two, to properly steward the gifts that have been given to us by you, members of our congregations and our synod partners. Number three, work with human resources to ensure we offer churchwide employees a competitive health plan which cares for our number one asset, our dedicated rostered leaders and staff, and allows us to attract and retain the brightest and best. All three expressions of the church are guided by the philosophy of benefits, which was mentioned, and is reviewed frequently to assure that these responsibilities just enumerated are achieved. The Church Council reviewed the philosophy of benefits at its last meeting in April of 2019. The guidance sets parameters but gives flexibility to each unit within the church to select benefit options that are best suited to their needs. The churchwide office plan and all related benefits we offer are in compliance with this guidance. The decision to move from gold to silver was a decision that CWO leadership and church council did not take lightly. It required faithful deliberation and prayer. It was determined that this decision was best for the long-term sustainability of this organization. There are various forms of funding the Silver Plan. The form that the ELCA Churchwide Office chose provides that we will fund 50% of the difference in deductible between gold and silver to each of our churchwide employees' health savings account. We also offer a waiver to those individuals who choose to have either themselves or their spouse's independence covered by another plan. Thank you. We've reached um, the time. I didn't think resource was restricted. What? <laughs> yeah, sorry. I just got a ruling from the secretary. I would have jumped ahead. Sorry. Microphone six. Joe Nolte, Memorials Committee, Church Council, and uh, Southeastern Iowa Synod. Um, so, so when Treasurer Fedick said that this was a prayerful and difficult decision, the tears we shed over this decision, you all should see. This is a decision that was not taken lightly. This decision was very emotional for me personally as someone who's been in the position of the Church Council and had to change a benefits plan because of budget um, because of budget constraints in an organization that I was a part of. It's not easy to say that we have to do this, but, but the, the trade-off that you don't realize, or maybe, maybe we, should, we need to tell you this, the trade-off, as we heard in the budget hearing, is that this represents 15 to 20 positions at the churchwide organization that won't have to be eliminated in order for us to keep a balanced budget. You elected a church council and you elected leadership in order to make the best financial decisions that we can to be stewards of your dollars. And I just ask that you continue to trust us to do so. Thank you. Microphone five. Pastor Hans Becklin, member of the ELCA Church Council. Reverend Chair, I rise in support of the motion to substitute. I am a pastor. 
My wife is a pastor. In our family, if the church is not willing to stand up and take care of us, there is no other employer who will do so. We need the support of the church because when we entered this ministry, this ministry that we as a church believe to be a call and not a job, the church made a covenant with us that our benefits would be different than those in the private sector, that our pension and health care would somehow counterbalance the relatively low pay and high debt that we experience as ordained pastors and now ordained deacons. This sets a terrible precedent for our entire church, a precedent that says we can race to the bottom just as the rest of our society has begun an economic race to the bottom. That is not just, and it does not support our future direction's goal to raise up more leaders, not just for Higgins Road, but for all 65 synods of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Thank you, microphone 12. Thank you, Reverend Chair. Clarence Smith, Church Council, I rise in opposition to the proposed amendment. Uh, as I have had the privilege of serving as the chair of the Budget and Finance Committee, Bishop Dunlop participated in our, in our committee hearings last November when we met in Chicago. From the Budget and Finance Committee, we took a very difficult decision to the full council. Faced with the reality of dwindling resources, including dwindling mission support, we saw the graph yesterday during the budget presentation, we knew that we had to make face some very difficult decisions. For that reason, the decision was made to move from gold plus to silver plus. Um, I would also say that in addition to that, we um, struggled with that and then I also participated in the Memorials Committee decision where this same topic came up. I did not participate in the budget hearings on Tuesday night, but I believe there was conversation at that. In all of these um, different <laughs> venues we have advocated for not returning to the Gold Plus. I urge members of the Assembly to defeat the amendment. Thank you. Microphone three. Thank you, Reverend Bishop. I'm Lucinda Bringman, Vice President of Lower Susquehanna Synod. When the Church Council adopted placing churchwide employees on the Silver Plan for 2019, they still retained the recommended gold standard for our church. Determining details of insurance plans for churchwide employees is not something best managed on the floor of our churchwide assembly. Our substitute memorial allows for time for the church council, the conference of bishops, and Portico to work together to make the best recommendation of a preferred insurance level for those who serve our church. As the church, we are the body of Christ, and we are called to care for one another. In many ways, this is a justice issue. And the resolution addresses the concern that those who are most vulnerable in our churchwide expression, namely those with smaller salaries in support positions, are the most vulnerable. The silver and gold plans are not equal plans that simply work differently. The silver plan has a higher deductible and a higher out-of-pocket maximum. Even though the silver plan includes a health savings account, that does not make up the difference. And we've already heard that the split between the insurance coverage and the participant coverage is 10% higher for participants in the silver plan. Healthcare costs continue to increase. And we know that many public entities and industries are and have moved to a similar direction to transfer healthcare costs to employees. But St. Paul calls us to not conform to this world. Shouldn't we as the church model for the world how to care for each other? Thank you. Thank you. Microphone four. Robert Malachek, Minneapolis Senate. I was struck when this action was proposed by the person in proposing the action saying that it's obvious that we have the money for it because we are a million dollars ahead on our income right now. That is all investment income and 100% dependent on the stock market. If we have any reversals in the stock market, we could very well end up being overnight a million dollars in the other direction or more. I don't think that we can use investment income in, to make decisions like this. If we want to 
improve what we can offer our people. We need to work on bringing our mission support contributions more in line with where they were five years ago plus. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have to call the orders of the day now. Please remember where you are in the queue. I call on Secretary Berger for announcements. Today's offering was $6,403.77 in checks and cash. It was designated to women's international leadership in initiatives, include, to women's leadership initiatives, including international women leaders. Choir rehearsal. There will be an additional choir rehearsal beginning promptly at 8.30 a.m. Saturday in the ballroom. Excuse me, 8 a.m. in the ballroom. Why am I making these? You have them already. <laughs> the presiding bishop uh, has requested the opportunity to, uh, with uh, Bishop-elect Strickland, to make a comment. Good evening, church. When we come to worship, we come to be fed by bread and wine, by water and word, by song and community of body. We should not come to worship ever experiencing homophobic, xenophobic, any other phobic or any sort of uh, racial behavior. That behavior of racism was exhibited in a picture that was shown in worship yesterday, and I take full and 100% responsibility for it being shown. For the past five years, I've been able to serve you as the assistant to the presiding bishop and the executive for worship for this church, and I've attempted to do so faithfully. We spend two years planning the worship for the churchwide assembly with tens of thousands of details, 30 to 40 people who help us this, this week, which I'm grateful for. And unfortunately, this was one detail, one very major detail that fell through the cracks. I grieve because I know that through that, many of you grieved. I am deeply apologetic. And even though tomorrow at 10 a.m., I am finished with this job and I can turn my attention to being the bishop-elect of the Southeastern Synod. But I do not walk away without addressing this and the responsibility that I have for it as the person who's been the caretaker of worship for this church. And so we have met with our worship team and the team of 40 volunteers. I've met with our colleague, John White, who will be the interim assistant to the presiding bishop for worship. He is committed to, with presiding bishop Eaton, to make sure we put into place our authentic diversity that this church so needs. We pledge to you that not only will we do better, we must. So I extend this apology to you and I ask your forgiveness and I ask that you know that it's important to hold one another accountable. May God continue to guide us and bless us knowing that as a family of God, sometimes as family members, we don't always get it right. Bishop. I also take responsibility as presiding bishop of this church. Uh, one thing that was pointed out to me was that, the, that this was unintentional, but the degree of cultural competency that we have in this church is lacking. And so this, we've, we've said what we're going to do is going to be painful and difficult, but we're committed to do it. And so I also apologize. Thank you. Continuing with the announcements, while you had a reprieve this morning from turning in your voting machines and passing them to the right, you do not have it tonight. Please remove your voting cards and pass your voting machines to the right. And also, before leaving the convention center at the end of the assembly, remember to return your ELCA-provided iPad. See the announcements section in the guidebook for complete instructions on how to return the iPad. And lastly, if you have dishes at your place, 
There are tables in the back of the hall where they can be returned. That concludes the announcements. Thank you. Just to let you know um, that the reception begins at 5.30, I think just just a pre-function outside hall, dinner at 6, um, and we're going to see a, a quick video now on the 50th anniversary. When I was a 13-year-old in confirmation class and um, was told by the pastor uh, what the possible careers were in the church and described uh, being a pastor, I said, yes, that's what I want to do. And he turned pale and said, oh, oh, but you can't. Our church doesn't ordain women. So immediately I decided that's what I did want to do. time that I preached shortly after my ordination in my home parish, there was an older guy who didn't think women should be pastors. He saw that I was going to be preaching at worship, and so he went outside and mowed the lawn during the worship service. I think God was calling all kinds of women to be pastors and bishops long before the church allowed. Maybe the question actually is, what happened to the church? That the church could finally hear God. And of course, if you look back at those decisions, they were simply, well, we think it's okay. We don't think we're going to get struck dead if we do this. It looks like, according to scripture, this would be okay. No energy, no enthusiasm of, wow, let's invite over half of the population that for 2,000 years has been not allowed to be in that leadership role in the church, let's let them be. The women that I have been surrounded by have never attempted to be leaders as their male counterparts have been, right? They're not attempting or trying to be leaders like the men in their lives. They're leaders in their bodies as they are, and they use the gifts that God has given them as women. Um, and I find, I find hope and grace in that, that we don't need to pretend to be what we are not. We get to be exactly who we are and God gets to use us uh, or uses us precisely because of who we are. I think women throughout the Lutheran tradition have been extraordinary in really uh, paving the way for future women and showing them that this is not just boy stuff. You know, this isn't just men's work to be done. This is everyone's work to be done. Having our first presiding bishop, uh, Elizabeth Eaton, be the first woman to be presiding bishop is really exciting. And we're living in a time where women in our church are doing more than ever before. This um, older woman, I think she must have been in her 80s, and uh, she had grown up in another Lutheran tradition, always felt called to the ministry, never could. And uh, I was um, administering communion at a gathering, and uh, she, was, she was weeping. And afterwards she said, I never expected that I would ever receive communion from the hands of a, a woman presiding bishop of the ELCA. My hope also is the fact that our voices are actually starting to be heard in this church. And again, there's a lot of pushback. But with Emmanuel 9, were sacrificed and murdered, we had to start to address the systemic racism in this church. And what I'm thankful for is that this church actually started doing that work. And it's a long, hard work, and there's some uncomfortable places and some dark places that people don't want to actually even talk about. But the fact that we're trying to do this gives me hope. If I think back to my ordination and I think of that day, first I would say keep wearing those awesome red shoes because I had these glorious red patent heels that I loved. Um, but then I would say remember all the people who were there. Remember the people from camp, from Yagam, from college, from seminary, from people who had known me since I was a baby, my Sunday school teacher. To go back and remember all of those people and remember that it's the whole church calling you into this work and to be excited about that. Without these women, 
I wouldn't be studying theology and I wouldn't be bringing my daughter to church and I certainly wouldn't be wanting to join the choir. These women have inspired me more than I can say and without them, I wouldn't be here. Thank you. I ask that um, we're going to take a time now to conclude in prayer. Uh, if Bishop Lorna Hollis from the Western Iowa Synod could lead us in a closing prayer and hymn. And afterward, the, re the, the assembly will be in recess until 1030 tomorrow. So why don't we start with the hymn? Oh, that's right. And 1030? I forgot it's 1030. Worship is at 8. It's at 8. But the, we're back in session at 10.30. Don't skip church. Okay, take my life that I may be, which is found on page 43. We'll start with that, and then Bishop Hallis will lead us in prayer. And worship choir rehearsals at 8 worship is at 8 30 i shouldn't have told you that because now you won't be early but um bishop hallis please let us pray we have come this far by faith ever loving god we give you thanks for the work of this assembly new initiatives planted existing ministry strengthened leaders elected to serve Draw your church together, O oh God, into one great company of disciples, together following our teacher, Jesus Christ, into every walk of life, together serving in Christ's mission to the world, and together witnessing to your love wherever you will send us, all for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.